Okay, and you just want to say hi, I'm Calvin, and then go from there? <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Sick. All right. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Calvin Rary, and I am a Bone Splitters aficionado. Uh, just a little bit about background about myself. Um, I've been playing Bone Splitters pretty much the entirety of 3.0. Uh, that's Age of Sigmar 3rd Edition. And it's an army that has gone through a lot of ups and downs that we're going to get into in a little while. Uh, briefly, the, the ups were pretty much in the stratosphere. Uh, and I like to think that I helped with that. Um, I got the world's first 4-1 with Bone Splitters back in February 2022 uh, at the Cherokee Open at, for Frontline Games in Cherokee, North Carolina. I got best in, in destruction there. And later that year, I also got a 4-1 ending up in 10th place at the Nova Open, one of the world's largest Age of Sigmar tournaments, uh, also getting best in destruction there as well. So I've had some really great success competitively. I've also written extensively about Bone Splitters. Um, there are articles that you'll, you know, if you look for me on Google, you'll find them. They're thesis links. So if you have an hour or two that you want to read up about an army of mostly naked green orcs, uh, feel free to do so. And hopefully this video is going to help you guys out and learn about how to win with this army and how to have fun with it most of all, because there is a lot of fun to be had and you'd be surprised just how competitive this army can be. I, I have fun when I win. I Winning is great. Uh, and you know what? Winning with an unexpected ways is even better. And that's what this whole army works with. And uh, we'll get a lot more into it later, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Blade so he can introduce himself as well. Hey everyone, I'm Blade Duel, uh, also a Bone Splitters aficionado. I jumped into Bone Splitters basically with the launch of the first Org Warclans book in 2nd edition, um, because at that point I had assembled enough to really jump in, and they had a really different play style, and I loved the narrative. Like, the army's got such a, like, it really leans into that like orc humor, and I'm all about that. Uh, as far as what I've done, um, I've gotten a couple of three twos, uh, some two threes, depending on like matchups and stuff like that. I've done better at RTTs or the like three Os. Um, generally, just have a positive win rate since I don't get to attend tournaments much. But um, I love the way the army plays; that it plays on kind of a different axis than a lot of other ones, and it has definitely a unique like feel and piloting style and um i love the look of the army i love the lore of the army and it is so weird um that i want to share that with all of you so uh hopefully you can do one of my favorite things where you walk up to a table and be like hi have you played bone splitters before and they'll say no and i said i i could have guessed that so let me tell you how this is going to work and then you tell them all about the faction that is also my favorite thing to do, is getting to explain how this army works over and over and over and over. Because I think between Blade and I, we're like 50% of people who play this army competitively, uh, at least regularly, uh, which we'll get into in a little while. But uh, this army is a blast, and we are really happy to hear that uh, people are going to want to you know, hear about this. Uh, we don't get this opportunity very often. I know a few Bone Splitter players. Absolute champions. I love them. <laughs> tell, tell them. Tell them I love them. Just, just champions. Uh, okay, so uh, cool. So why don't we jump right into... Uh, so can you guys paint me a picture of this army's overall strategy? Like, if I was, if I was thinking to myself, like, I want to get into Bone Splitters. I, I love the way the faction looks. What's the well, like? What's the play style like? How do how do games flow? How do they function? What's what's the energy of the army? Oh boy, um, I'm gonna go first because there's a lot that goes into what makes Bone Splitters Bone Splitters, and I want to start off with what people think of the idea as an orc, like the classical Warhammer orc, right? Like you look at these guys, they're naked or they have just like loincloths and bones on. And they look like people who just want to charge and charge and charge and charge and get into combat. And that's not what you want to do with bone splitters at all. That's the thing. So people normally are worried about like combat because this is Age of Sigmar is a simulation of mighty battles in an unending age of war. Well, bone splitters 
wants to fight, but only when it's to their advantage. And so a lot of what makes Bone Splitters good is you have a huge volume of bodies sometimes with a lot of wounds that can stand on objectives really well. And even more importantly, they can get onto the objectives early and then block the objectives from your opponent being able to get onto them. Uh, typically, you'll see people who do well with Bone Splitters, like Blade and myself, uh, we do what's called a pinning strategy, which is we want to block our opponent's ability to move out of their deployment zone and prevent them from being able to really get onto the objectives. Because ultimately, this is a game of scoring points on circles, right? And we want to protect those circles as much as possible. And the best way to do it for bone splitters is to put bodies directly in front of your opponent and then prevent them from moving away from them. And you'd be surprised how easy it is uh, right, uh, right now and previously in previous metas um, to do just that. Um, and it's one of those things that people don't respect is they think, oh, I have to get into combat and I have to start fighting as soon as possible. And the reality is, is you only want to fight when you know the thing that you're fighting will die. Because we'll get into the wards and the battle traits uh, for the bone splitters wall later but overall you're not trying to just smash your opponent right off the table you want to deny them points while scoring maximum on the objectives and scoring your tactics and so there's a lot of pre-positioning and planning that has to go through it um just word of warning if you you could totally just ignore everything i just said and just throw your entire army into your opponent but uh buyer beware in that sort of situation i i, I don't know if, uh yeah we'll go with that for now um what about you blade yeah so the way i typically describe the play style of the army is like you have a lot of meat and you use that meat to control space so you have yeah a lot of bodies either as big blobs or msu you're moving it up onto the objectives quickly and um you're kind of like you're playing footsies, right? You're you're engaging space. You're trying to control and corral your where your opponent moves, either through making it so they don't want to charge somewhere else, or making it so they do want to charge, kind of where you want them to charge. Uh, similar to, uh, I think I've heard Aaron describe it in Big Wall. You want to leave your opponent like just multiple bad decisions, um, mm -hmm. and you you want all of your opponent's decisions to be ones that you also want. Um, and you've got a couple of I guess it, part of the overall army strategy is literally just getting people to run into your Wergog's kill zone. And that's part of the, the space control. Um, if they don't know, they'll fall prey to it and you'll feel bad. And if they do know, then you can actually like use some of these pieces to like influence how your opponent moves beyond the mechanics themselves, which is a fun, a fun kind of game. Um, I know you like your, your magic analogies. If I were to compare this, I'd say this is kind of like Pox, where you're winning this long attrition war where you will both lose, you will lose more, and you're hoping that you can just kind of outlast your opponent when it comes across the finish line. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot of like, like really nurgly kind of vibes, right? Mm -hmm. Like just out, outlast, outgrind your opponent with your raw amount of meat. Am I? Is I'm correct, right? Yeah. The, 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 yeah. A, a really good analogy would be the all, "Oops, all flies" list for Nurgle, especially, where they use pregame moves to move up. They have these big chunky bodies that take an absolute eternity to kill, and some armies just don't have the punching ability to yes. punch their way out of it. Um, how? So my question is this: How does Bone Splitters rank against other armies that have similar sort of play styles or similar play um, like components to their game? So um, I'll take a first stab here, uh, just because right now pinning strategies aren't really a thing at the moment. Mostly because with this new meta, um, people are really dominated on. I want to cast the big spells. I want to have floods of minimum strength units across the board. So right now, you really don't have many armies f flopping around that can do what Bone Splitters potentially does, which is just get up in your face and then take forever to kill. Because hammer units, 
uh, if you think of a hammer and anvil strategy, a hammer should be able to pick up a block of troops in one shot. Well, what Bone Splitters does well is dictate the flow of combat in a way where if a person has very few hammers, um, you can time the the wah, which is a once per game four up ward for the whole army, uh, to deny them the ability to punch out. And more or less, if you compare, the only real army that you can compare that to right now is the Oops All Flies list. And the Oops All Flies list, instead of having a huge volume of wounds, they have disgustingly resilient. And they have some tricks that help extend the durability of their troops. Um, and even then, that right now, you don't even see a lot of. Right, because Bone Splitters of... generally have poor saves, right? Uh, it's it, it's a six up unless it's the Wargard Prophet, in which case it's a five up. That's it. That's the whole army. Six up save, six up board. Yep. The guys That's with it. shields have a five. Oh Better my bad. That, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Guys yeah. with shields do have fives. I heard someone say that when if you know orcs get a new book or whatever that the Iron Jaws need to be three up, Cruel Boys need to be four up, and Bone Splitters need to be five up. That we if need like, a plus one save across the book. If you're following the modern design philosophy, yeah, and that's part of Warclans as a whole has kind of fell to that, in that like yeah, power they're group. they're they're built around what 2.0 looked like, yeah, and then as it's gone on, like mod units have just gotten tougher, which has shifted which armies perform, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at zombies, like ju just zombies themselves, um, they went from having a no save whatsoever to jumping to a six up save. And that jump is an enormous durability buff. Uh, so if you, I would be ecstatic to see things like uh, our favorite naked naked lads go to a to a five up save. I would not doubt to see them instead keep the saves, but instead just go to a generic five up ward. I would not be surprised to see that. Right. Whether whether or not that's better, I have no idea. But <laughs> I, I would not be, I would not be surprised to see if that's a choice because after all, they are completely naked. I know some nerd right now just pa is coming back from having paused the video and having done the math. Can, good for you. Good for you, friend. <laughs> good for you. Okay. So, so I've got some thoughts on how it it matches up as well. Um, at least for my play style, I know Calvin typically is a bit more on pigs than I am. Uh, I tend to think of this army to play kind of like Big Wa, but more controlling. Big Wa, you hit your, your buffs where you're plus one hit, plus one wound, and then you turn the corner and suddenly you're this kind of like offensive powerhouse. Whereas with this army, you're just kind of like keeping control the whole game. There's no like, suddenly I'm going to like blow you off the table. It's a like progressive glacial race to round five. Sweet. I like it. Should we move forward and uh, talk about battle traits? Absolutely. So the question isn't like what the battle traits are; it's how they play. Like, what do the battle traits mean for you as iron, as bone splitter players? So, there's three of them, and I think so. Blade, what which which of them are your favorite? What's your favorite battle trait for bone splitters? I'm just curious. Pilot hunters. All right, well, Tireless, Tireless Trackers, whatever, that, that one, the pregame move. Easily. I think it's the most unique thing the army has, uh, and that's where, like, half of your units get to make a pregame move, either five or eight inches, depending. And so that lets you really mess with people, because uh, opponents just aren't prepared for the game to change that much before either player takes a turn. Yeah. And suddenly, the sure charges they set up, uh, like... Y y it starts in deployment where you figure out like you're watching how they deploy and you deploy knowing that you're going to be five or eight inches up in a direction and how to exploit that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the really big thing is, uh, and I, I know going back to earlier, I mentioned like a uh, mighty battles and an unending age. this, this game is a, is really 80% of this game is the movement phase. And then there's other 20% where things happen where we roll dice. And that's what Bone Splitters is really good at is the movement phase. You have the, you have the pregame move, which starts at 5 inches, and then with a command trait, goes to 8 inches. And that 8-inch pregame move on most of these maps means you're 
grabbing the objectives in the no man's lands of the maps yeah before the game has even started and there's a and lot allowed, of those there's a lot of those in this in this ghb so mm -hmm. um there's a lot of focus right now on creating the perfect castle and sometimes if you castle up too much bone splitters and this is going back to the first ghb um, you can surround the castle, and then they are going to have a very hard, like at the top of one, and then they are going to have a very hard time getting out of it. Um, that pregame move so impactful. It's part of the reason why I got uh, 10th place at Nova, is because you pregame move eight inches, and then your opponent looks, because if you're like 12 drops, you pregame move, then your opponent has to look at your army and go, what do I do? Yeah, and it pregame moves like before anyone takes a turn. Right, so you always, mm -hmm. get, even if you're going second, you still get to pregame move. Yep. Well, it, right. It's, so that's you, the part you that's move interesting before determining. Right. Yep. Is... Right. So like all three of the orc or clan sub or sub factions have their own way of movement. Right. You have super sneaky, mighty destroyers, and tireless trackers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tireless trackers is really the one that is the most aggressive early. Right. It's the only one that mm -hmm. happens if you're going second. I guess. Super Sneaky also does the same thing, but, um, I mean, that's not even a sub-faction or a thing for Cruel Boys, right? That's a command trait. Anyway, but, um, uh, yeah, but it's not, it's only one unit. It's not, like, what did you say? It's half your army, right? Yeah. Yep. Right. So that's a lot of movement. And you get to pick and choose, right? So if you, for every mm -hmm. unit that you have mounted, you might have, like, some wizard where you don't even give a shit about moving it forward. It feels to me like you would be moving a large percentage of like almost all every unit that you would want to move would get to move in a yeah. sense you know what i mean yeah and mm -hmm. there's and there's one particular trick with that that <laughs> has absolutely caught people with their pants down um a lot of and um, we're talking exclusively about missions where you deploy 18 inches away from each other right so using an example like spring the trap uh, the territories touch, and then you deploy nine inches away from your opponent's territory. Well, if you have a Wargog Prophet, which we're going to get all into that, he, he he deserves an hour to himself, but well, not going to be an hour. But we'll talk about the Wargog Prophet in more detail. But basically, he has, a, he has a War Scroll ability, for those of you who don't know, that allows him to uh, basically get into a staring contest, and the staring contest goes on uh, essentially either until the Wargog Prophet is dead or the thing he's staring at is dead, an enemy unit. And it's a range of 12 inches. So if you're deploying 18 inches away from each other and you forward deploy your Wargog Prophet all the way up to the line where you can deploy your troops and your opponent also does the same thing, if you make an 8-inch pregame move with the Wargog Prophet, that Wargog Prophet is at the top of one in staring range of, with this war scroll ability which has a theoretical infinite damage cap at the top of one and you can really catch your opponent into weird positions where they they don't realize it's happening or they do realize that happens and now their entire deployment math has just been thrown out the window and it's it, i've gotten to do it a few times blade hopefully you have too it's it's so wonderful when you catch someone in that trap because uh, they're in immediate danger of whatever is in range of the Wargog Prophet or just dying instantly. Doesn't could be a Mega Gargan. Doesn't matter. Whatever it is could just die. Yeah, definitely leans into that the the mental portion of the playstyle that I like of Bone Splitters. Every time that I've because you explain what it does beforehand because you really don't want your opponent to run into it. It feels really bad. But mm -hmm. then you they they open you up and you move forward and then you say okay, if or I'm in within 12 range, who do you want to give the first turn or something? Because usually you're going to expect to go first. But now, uh, so many times I've, when I've done that, they all immediately have to rethink their whole plan of them going second round one because I'm going to blow off their key aggressive unit that they left out right, in the they, open. They need a chance to move or kill your wizard, or, right, to kill the Wargog. You know, it's, it's really funny to me how of the four orc armies that you can play, only one of them is really like, charge, go get them. The other three are all sort of weirdly controlly. Right? Mm -hmm. Destruction is very much like almost like a blue wizard uh, sort of faction, right? Getting back to those Magic the Gathering analogies. Yep, absolutely. It, it and and it's it's weird because if you 
Age of Sigmar isn't nearly as popular as like Warhammer 40,000, right? And so most people, when they think orcs, they've either seen The Lord of the Rings or they've seen like Warhammer 40,000, and they think of these giant muscle-bound brutes who do nothing but want to get into combat as soon as possible. And a lot of people who pick up bone splitters, they do that, and they find out the hard way that you don't want to do that. But if you take advantage of things like tireless trackers and then these other two battle traits, um, you can really squeeze them out. Like, you really squeeze out some great efficiency. And then to Blade's point is the mental game is next level because A, people don't play against this army very much, and B, when you start setting up, the, you start setting up a puzzle box where your opponent can't get out of. It, it, to use a, a magic analogy, I don't even know if this is a deck anymore. But a year or two ago, or longer, time means nothing at this point, there was Lantern Control, which controlled basically the flow of the game for the Magic player and their opponent, and you're dictating the actions they can and cannot do. And because you're just setting up bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, because no one wants to fight a unit of five boar boys. Like, they don't want to do it. Yeah. But if you force them to then, you know, there's possibilities where it's, you know, you're wasting your gigantic expensive unit just killing 140 points worth of models and you've basically wasted an entire turn of theirs. Well, like you said, you uh, are denying space, you're denying time mm -hmm. with uh, meat. Meat space. I like that. I'm going to trademark it. Meat space. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what about Spear of Gorka Morka? What do you, uh, what, what are your, what's your impressions of, of that? Like how, how does that play out in your games? Spear of Gorka Morka is phenomenal. It, it it's really the cream of the crop here when it comes to like just generic battle traits. It's so good they gave it to OCR Bone Reefers, right? The whole army just has exploding sixes. It's great. Like it's so efficient. And the thing is, is when you look at the War Scrolls, right, for Bone Splitters, no one hits on a 3-up, except for uh, Big Stabas, which, rest in peace, Big Stabas. We'll talk about that later. But I mean, the army has a high volume of dice, right? So if you're and, looking to get into Bone Splitters, or if you play Bone Splitters, like, you know that, mm -hmm. right? Like, you're, buckets of dice for this army. Huge, huge yeah, volume. and it's for, like, almost everybody, right? Like, almost every unit is, like, a high volume, um, yeah, dice. Yeah, the the one exception, and this is, I I understand why GW did it, but the the exploding sixes does not apply to shooting attacks, which matters only for one unit, and that's arrow boys, which is okay. Um, if you like shooting eight hundred times in a in a shooting phase, the boy is this the army for you. Otherwise, I don't recommend it because the cream of the crop here is definitely melee. Like a unit of boar boy maniacs, yes, they have the coherency issue, but of, of being cavalry and, and being in blocks of five. But five boar boy maniacs is 36 attacks on the charge. Like, that's a lot. And then, you know, if you bump it up to 10, you can easily get at least eight of them in, then that's 56. If you're creative with your pylons, you could potentially get all 10 in, in which case we're talking. Um, 71 attacks on the charge and that is a lot of damage uh that can that can pile up quickly even against high saves yeah and then um, one in six explodes so it's like you're getting even more dice back exactly exactly um i think that's all i've got to say but it's it's really it's just great it's so much fun um what about you blade it's pure adrenaline man <laughs> um, I don't know. It's it is really fun when like you're like you charge with a unit of ten guys and they're like okay and you're like all right I'm gonna roll forty one dice right now hold on and then you, <laughs> you know roll a dice into your bucket and then pick out these sixes and I'm like these are actually two um, or I guess conversely on some units that have few attacks that but that actually matter like on your big stabas or maybe a big boss if you're running those like when you roll more attacks than you started with it just it feels so good. It so does. <laughs> it's so good. 
it, it, it's so good. Like this this three hundred this three hundred point unit is chucking seventy attacks, or this one hundred and sixty point unit is chucking forty attacks, and those exploding sixes build up quickly, um, especially because of one of the sub factions for bone splitters is ice bone, which is my preference. Uh, Blade has his, which I'll let Blade talk about here in a second. Well, I think at the end we have three lists where there's one of each sub faction, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is. We'll, we'll talk about we'll talk we'll talk about the arrow, but uh, the uh, ice bone, the big one to keep in mind with Spirit of Gork and Mor Morka is you get exploding sixes to hit, and then ice bone uh, sixes to wound. Uh, deal mortal wounds equal to the damage characteristic of the attack, and then the attack sequence ends. So you're chucking 70 attacks with exploding sixes, and then you're converting a significant portion of those into, into mortal wounds on the back end, uh, on the two wound on the uh, attack sequence. So a, a unit of boys, you know, just looking at their stats, if you just look at the War Scrolls, they don't seem very good, but then you add in the battle trade and the sub faction, and suddenly you're punching way above your weight. Um, and then you know that also applies to heroes. I've done hilarious things with war cogs in combat, just because sometimes you just roll sixes. Yep. If if you love rolling sixes, um, like if you get that huge dopamine hit when you see those like six pips on the dice, like there's a lot here in this faction for you if you can um have some patience and not just run at your opponent oh absolutely if you like the number six this is the army for how about the wa oh boy how uh, when, right oh mine uh there's so i'm gonna I, I i've written a lot about this one in particular um the the shorthand is is the army has a six up ward across the board right uh just generically thanks to their tattoos um the Bone Splitter's Wall is, and this is key, your general who has the Bone Splitter's keyword has to be alive and at the start of any combat phase and only for that combat phase, you set the wards for the army to a four up. So there are gonna be times where you could combo charge your opponent's army and use it very aggressively because the thing that is you know the detriment to bone splitters is you have terrible saves but when you're relying on the pure math of four up wards um you can be a lot more aggressive only for that right. turn this is the only time i would recommend charging your whole army but that's is... another way that you could be quite tanky it wards mm -hmm. plus wounds right like you don't have to have a good save if you have a good ward and lots of wounds yep exactly you temporarily have 50 percent more meat correct no 100 mm -hmm. percent. yeah right yeah it's a lot yeah, right? or, it's a lot of 100 yeah wounds. you're right a lot more meat and i don't know i don't i didn't check on calvin's list but when we get to the list i wrote like there's there's a lot of meat in this army <laughs> um it's and kind of like i guess in cruel boys or it's the wa and learning how to leverage the wa and when to leverage the wa is mm -hmm. a, a big part of uh, a skill you need to learn to succeed. Yes. You, um, if, if you don't have a good WA as Cruel Boys, like you're not winning the game. If, you're, I, I if think... you win a game as Cruel Boys and you had a mediocre <laughs> or non existent WA, it's because you rolled a ton of sixes. That's why you yeah. won. Right? Like, yeah. So I, real. The, the secret, I think, on this one is it's, it's really awesome if you use it to deny a battle tactic or yes. something like that. They'll have a, they'll be like, you know, lift a unit or um something like that right they, you, or they'll they'll want to lift a unit to grab an objective and when you suddenly be like ah, ah ah no i have a lot more a lot more bodies there than you expected uh it can it can really like that a two or three point drop can be huge yeah absolutely um the you know it, it, if you set up the trap well enough with tireless trackers and then i this is part of the reason why um, I'm much bigger on uh, boar boys, which we'll get into later. Uh, but you can really set up traps where I've denied people scoring entirely. Like at the top of one, just because it, you you don't let them get out of their deployment zone. Maybe they score one because they have an objective in their in in their deployment zone, but then you just charge them. You get right in front of them, 
they attack you, you declare the law, and then they're stuck there for at least one entire other round. And it's so powerful. Yeah. And it's so easily wasted. It's the, the other problem. Right? The momentum of it all. Yeah. It's the, like, the oh, I was going to do this. I was going to teleport and do this. And it's like, no, you're not. Like, you're yep. you're just you're just going to deal with the green tide for right now, actually. Yep. You're, you're going to stay exactly where right. you are. And you're going to play on my terms. That. And my terms is you have to break out of this green tide. Can you do mm -hmm. it? Right? It's like, I don't care what else you can do. If you can't do this one thing, you're not going to get to play this game. You're going to yep. sit on your side while I play the game. Exactly. Hey, destruction! Look, destruction is the good. They're the good guys. I, I, I don't care what people say about order and all. These guys, they just want to fight. We're definitely okay? having the most fun. Oh, they're they're having a blast. Oh, by far the most fun by far. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, the WA, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, it's quite an interesting use because it feels to me like of all the WAs, maybe big WA we could sort of add to this category a little bit, it seems to me one that you need to use the most strategically because you can use it for, like, you can use it in different kinds of ways to me, I feel, mm -hmm. right? It's the one... It seems like it's the highest skill ceiling law in the book. I would agree. I, I I would definitely agree as well. Iron Jaws is the lowest skill ceiling. Right? It's like you use it. Yep. Right? When you when you fight for the first time for real, you use your wah. Cruel Boys mm -hmm. is kind of in, in, in the between, and so is um, Big Wah, I think. Big Wah, using the wah is, it kind of can be tricky, but can also be kind of self-evident as well sometimes. Okay, cool. Anything else about the any battle traits, or do you guys want to move on to the season? We'll talk about uh, the season. Um, I'll, I'll just add this. Um, it's the battle traits that make this army functional, more more than any other arm, because you know this is developed at the very beginning of third edition. These three look really simple. You know, tireless tractor, spirit of Gork, and Morka, the bone splitters wall. But it's the complexity that these add to the army that really help you win games that you're not supposed to. Because it turns this army from middling war scrolls to pretty darn efficient war scrolls to a very tough to put down army if your opponent does not know what they're doing. It's very true yeah. that if you just look through the war scrolls and bone splitters, it's very disappointing. Yeah, lots it's, of fours. It's not the it's not an elite army in any regard. Right. Even for the people who like the army, it was pretty disappointing when the third book came out. <laughs> right, right. All right, so uh, everyone's familiar, I'm sure, with the uh, realm rules. So I don't feel like we need to go over them or cover them. My question to you is, uh, how like how about this for, for a starter? What locuses are, are you using for this season? Uh, Wargog Prophet. Sure. And yep. <laughs> the Wardock. Have you, have you considered at all any allies for this? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna default here to Blade. Blade, how, how are you feeling about? Uh, as, go ahead. As, so as far as uh, low side go, like Prophet, definitely Wardock too. And I think the the Maniac Weird Knob has some case uses as well, depending on how you've tailored your list. Being able to skyrocket your mounted hero across the board and fire off two spells. If you're managing to go second, can be pretty big, right, depending on how you load him up. He's a locus as well, isn't he? Right. It yeah. doesn't have the no mount clause That's like right. the uh, champions did. That's yeah. Right. The, what, That's what gets great. people what, what gets people tripped up is when they read the Antorian Acolytes Battalion, yes. and in that one they have to be unmounted. But mm -hmm. yeah, you can definitely have a, ma uh, a, a man mounted Acolytes this season. Sorry, ma mounted loci this season. Well, I'm looking at the list right now, and from Gloom Spite, you can get the Fungoid, Cave Shaman, Madcap Shaman, the Web Spinner Shaman, but I feel like Wergog, Wardock, and Maniac Weird Knob are strictly just better. Like, they're just, yeah. They're yeah. just better. It's like you don't, they, you don't even want the allies because you have such good casters here, right? I think Scragrot's a good mention, though. I think there's actually game for Scragrot, depending on what your like meta looks right, like. Right, but he's not a Locust, though. Oh yeah, he's not a locust. Right. Sorry. No, I'm right. just talking about locusts. Well, I mean, we'll talk. We can. We'll have a section on allies later, right? We can talk about 
good old Scraggy, right? Scraggy yeah, is just yeah, a yeah. good, mm -hmm. solid, solid hero, it, right? Yeah, it, 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 every Bone Splitters list, if, if you're out there, and hopefully by the end of we'll have converted a few of you guys to play Bone Splitters, um, everyone is going to play with a Wargok Prophet. It, it's, he, it is, it's so hard to describe just how important the Wargok Prophet is to how Bone Splitters works. And just the mind games that you play with it, that everyone will play it. War Dog is cool because it makes War Dog profit casting better. The Maniac Weir Knob is great to Blades Point because we'll get into trait mount traits later. It's really just the mount trait, to be honest. But you can hero phase move a Maniac Weir Knob and then Blizzard someone to death. Like yeah. it's great. Yep, I, I've considered both the both of those in Big Wa, right? Because I'm playing Big Wa for a GT in August, and that's what. I was. I, I definitely considered them. I, I I looked really hard. Eighty point Wardock is so good for eighty mm -hmm. points in like in Big Wa. I mean, I can't speak to Bone Splitters, but I wanted. I want to teleport a Wardock and cast Blizzard, right? I want to. I want to mm -hmm. throw. I want to use all my Primal Dice all game uh, to unbind with Gobsprack, and then suddenly be like, oh Wardock, like I want to cast a spell with a six in it and be like Primal Dice. Right, like just start yeah. rolling primal dice till I get another six, and be like, "Oh, Blizzard, done. Here you go, suck it." It, it it's so good. And th here's the here's the other thing. Um, unlike Scragrod and the Warsong Revenant, whose War Scroll spells got uh, eroded to say the unmodified casting yes. roll, the Wargog Prophet's War Scroll spell did not get eroded, Correct. so it still says the casting roll of ten or more. So a war doc can issue, can just skip casting spells to on a three up, give a war gog plus one, and then that war gog prophet can feed primal dice into it to at 24 inches potentially clear, you know, half of a unit of chaff essentially. And what's just that absolutely uh, dumped What's that spell called again? I can't remember. The fists of Gork. The fist of Gork. Yeah, it's, oh, um, you roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in the enemy unit, and I think it's just mm -hmm. uh, within 24 inches. Just right? within 24, Which is a yep. huge range. And then uh, if you, um, uh, 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 if you, if you use, effectively, if you use primal dice to cast it, right, because you need a 10 up, so if you're, the average roll of 3d6 is 10, right, so if you're going to use primal dice, then, yeah, it's a 4 up, so if it's a unit of 20, you're going to deal 10 mortals. Yep. Right, and, and that's it, a lot. And it's it's so good because at least again, coming from Big Wa, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. you're playing a horde army. Okay, well, I'm gonna uh, fist of Gork you from twenty four, and then I'll laser you from twelve and laugh. Yep, and that that's the thing. People are not gonna respect that, and they're gonna no, get they're absolutely gonna forget. punished by it. Yeah, it's gonna be your little wargogs hiding behind a a piece a terrain piece, and suddenly he's like, here I am. And ha ha, yep. like gotcha. And getting within 12, of, in, to your point, Moss, getting within 12 of a War Dog that has Blizzard and a yeah. fully loaded up uh, War Dog Prophet means probably two things are going to die that turn. Oh, yeah. It's scary. Like, they're scary. Um, so, for optimal focus, are you preferring the extra cast? Or are you taking the command trait? Or... Is it really like you're you're swinging back and forth depending on your list and the matchup and the situation and so on? Uh, mine's real simple. I'm always taking the extra cast because I, to what Blade said earlier about the Maniac Weird Knob, I, I fully intend on doing that because I want the Maniac Weird Knob to be able to cast two spells. His War Scroll spell is really good and then his, he, he can take uh, Chloe Green Tusks, which makes mount attacks a lot better. I play a lot of mounted units, so I get a lot of value of, out of that for taking the extra cast there. Um, what about you, Blade? I I would say I would default to the cast just because our faction has like surprisingly okay magic, and then we we if you put it on the war doc or the war gog, we'll get to it later. You can stack casting bonuses on some of your casters, right? So um, that's useful. However, lately I've been running into like a lot of techless and catacross type things where I get denied CP. And we do need some CP to work, especially because 
you know, a lot of our things are hitting on fours. So um, if you already have a way to set up some spells to help you out, getting that CP to either survive a battle shock and, you know, keep the meat going, or um, make sure you can reroll your charges to get to where you need to or redeploy, it, you can't be out of CP. And sometimes you have enough spells uh, that there you don't need all of them. So what what I'm sort of understanding is you want to take the you want the extra spell unless you really have a plan for what you're going to use your command point for. Mm -hmm. Right, but the spell is always going to be good. Yeah, yeah. and or at the, least the other more times than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing to remember is when you're picking, uh, you're picking either an Entorian Locus or you're not. Which in Bone Splitters means you're either picking a Savage Big Boss to get the command point, or you're picking an ally hero to get a command point. Because otherwise, every other hero unit in in Bone Splitters is a wizard, and is thus an Entorian Locus. So you're almost always going to do the extra spells unless you're specifically building in a way to take advantage of that extra command point. I think, um, let me just check one thing real quick. I, I think even if you pick a, oops, even if you pick a locus, I think you can still choose a command point. Ooh, can you? Ooh. I think so. Hold on. Uh, pick one friendly hero on the battlefield. If that hero is a locus, they can attempt to cast. Never mind. Nope, oh, never mind. You, you can pick any hero, but if it is a locus, it gets a cast. Dream is dead. Dream is dead. <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. No worries. Misremembering. Yeah. Yeah. If they are not an Entorian Locus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll get to lists later, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's part of why the, the choices that I made is in there. Because to Blade's point, it really sucks when you need to all out attack and you can't. Or, uh, considering the army has terrible bravery across the board, one inspiring presence, but you can't. Right. Because I. Like in the uh, in the other orc books, there's units that can replicate the commands, right? Like a mega boss, right? Can you shoot mm -hmm. more than once? Crew boys have the vulture, not a great one, right? But it's 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 there. Are there any tools like that in the bone splitter books? Nope. You have, so you the have the heroic you action get. for an extra CP. Right. <laughs> That's and it. Then, That's what you got. And from what I've seen in your lists, there seems to be like a, a high number of units. That you're that you tend to run, mm -hmm. right? So right. That, so I'm running warlord. Attack, yeah, that all that attack can. All oh, right. So you run warlords, right? That's that's one thing you do, right? For a little bit of. CP yeah, it gives you an help. extra CP on usually. I find yeah. I usually end up using warlord on turn three. Yeah. To get me through. I I'm I'm generally doing it on turn two these days with my orcs, but. But yeah, I hear you. It yeah it's that extra CP can help. And yes. a lot of times your big boss is your general, and if he's dead, you can't choose the locus, so you're kind of screwed on oh, CP anyways. <laughs> it's so nice yep. when you have so many CP, like playing yes. factions and playing armies that are CP rich. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it makes the game, it's like easy mode. It's like you don't have to think about it. You're like, oh yeah, I'll redeploy. Or like, oh yeah, sure, why not? Because, sure. It's not like you really have to think and pick and choose and sweat over how you're going to use your cp you just use it is it uh bone reapers that have like five or something they get a huge number nine uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah i've only played against them a couple of times but the first time it was like sorry what like you you get what <laughs> like huh like i was playing lots of cruel boys at the time and i was so jealous i'm like i never have enough cp and you're like oh yeah mm -hmm. like i just do all the things all the time it's like that mm -hmm. it's like i hate you mm -hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> and then they take catacros and then they steal your command points it's like oh yep. god easy game mm -hmm. how about uh null storm ad adornments i know that you're you're never going to take them in this army have you played it against them at all and have like have you even seen them on the, on the table yet uh so here's the thing about the null storm ador null stone adornments um the the infinite unbind one the null stone icon uh, I think that's what it's called. Is is it's it's good, right? Now you have to think about the armies that you're reliably going to see uh, that are going to have that. That's like Fire Slayers, which is a terrible matchup for Bone Splitters anyway. And then there's Corn, which, depending on how the Corn is built, might be a good or uh, not good, but at least decent matchup to a bad matchup. 
Um, the Nullstone Icon, or, or in Sons of Bayamon as well, obviously. But for the most part, that's the one you're probably always going to see. And to me, it's more or less as if they just use their heroic action to get an extra commi- an extra um, right. an extra unbind for me. Um, the 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 pouch of Nullstone dust is interesting because for one, rules is written right now, it's functional. Because the, they FAQ'd how the, the fact that primal dice for casting is a modifier, yes. but they didn't update the wording on the pouch of nullstone yeah, dust. So there was some if confusion you put, around that. For, yeah. Yeah. So if you play it, rules is written right now, it doesn't even. Yeah, it, but it, I think it, it, from what I've understood from everybody that I've talked to is the intention is is apparent. Yeah. So I think for most sure. people are yeah playing by intention on this one. Yeah, and it, it, and it's not nothing to to scoff at because, for with nullstone with the nullstone dust, it's like, if I remember correctly, starting at two dice, you're at a twenty percent likelihood of rolling the one the pairs of one, two, or three, and then it gets significantly higher once you start adding primal dice in. Yeah. Um, realistically, you're capped out at casting five times in a turn if the war dock is buffing the war dog profit it, you're casting up to four times in a turn if you're going second and you make one of them the yeah, give them an extra cast if the war dog profit is staring you're probably going to use the war dock to heal the war dog profit so at most you're casting two times with a maniac weird knob or like additional war dog profits or whatever and then at that point like is it super impactful i don't think so so unlike most unlike other armies where they have a lot of casting um no stone dust isn't gonna really impact us too hard so you're not Mostly. afraid of them no nah. and they're like if you see it at a table you're like oh okay like it's not really gonna change my plan i'm just gonna have to be careful for a turn yeah, it, it just means, uh, and Blade, feel free to, you know, let me know how you feel about it too. But for the most part, I'm casting either Mystic Shield, Glowy Green Tusks, now Hoarfrost, in which case I'm not even saving anything for Unbinds at that point, probably. I'm probably just dumping everything to make sure those spells go off because those spells drastically improve the effectiveness of our, of, of our troops. Yeah. Yeah, I think I th- actually, uh, with the new ones and the GHB Bone Splitters has a pretty good breadth of spells, and so getting running into the dust uh, at an event which your TO should allow it um, could be problematic in that one phase. But luckily, most of your wizards have a non-casting mode <laughs> that you can kind of work with. Interesting. Um, cool. So let's move on to something different <laughs> so you mentioned the fist of gork and how you could use it with four up uh or with primal dice to get the four up mortals we talked about bone spirit uh what are some other spells that people should uh, be picking for their lists glowy green oh, tusks glowy green tusks that's the big one so glowy green um, tusks makes it so the tusk attacks you pick a pin unit of pigs, and the tusk attacks for the pigs, just the tusks, are at two rent. Yep, because otherwise, if, you, if, you, if you're watching this, feel free to just thumb through the war scrolls and just <laughs> count how much rent there is. Spoiler alert, uh, not, that, not that much. So, glowy green tusks means every unit of boars out there has three attacks per pig on the mount attacks. And when they go from Ren 0 to Ren 2, it dramatically improves the output yeah. for for those pigs. That's what Hoarfrost is showing us this season. Yes, and that yeah. brings us to the next spell, which of course is going to be Hoarfrost for us, because the trick, uh, the trick to that is you can load up glowy green tusks on a unit of boars and set the mounts to Ren 2, and then, for instance, those boar boy maniacs who are all four attacks apiece on the riders... Uh, who have Ren Zero, you pick them with Horfrost, and they go from Ren Zero to Ren One, Ren Two, or you know, preferably Ren Three. In which case, a unit of ten Boar Boy Maniacs on the charge with Horfrost, Glowy Green Tusks, 
and then the bone spirit which is the war scroll spell from the uh, maniac weird knob which gives plus one to wound to this to uh, a, a bones a friendly bone splitters unit now you'll have a unit of boar boy maniacs making 41 attacks potentially at ren three with exploding sixes and sixes to wound or mortal wounds and then the mounts are then Ren 2, Exploding 6s, 6s to Wound or Mortal Wounds. It's it's an enormous amount of damage. And it punches up... Uh, if you run the math on it, distinct possibility that you one-shot a Mega Gargan with that level of output. Yeah, I've seen that in Iron Jaws, just on the pigs. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, throwing, throwing Rend at an attack that has high volume and no Rend is explosive. It's, yep. It's yeah. so good. It feels great. Yep. But from a math perspective, uh, other buffs not considered, you can expect low green tusks to add like one to two uh, wounds to your damage for every five. Yep. For every okay. five models in the unit, sorry, let me say that. So a unit of ten, you can expect it to add like two to five damage on your output. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the glow green tusk works in addition to hoarfrost? So you you use glowy green tusks. You set the mounts to Ren two, and then Horfrost sets the riders right. to Ren one, two, or three. So you're you're so they have nothing to do with each other. Exactly. They're not, they're not Cause interacting. You have to pick a, right. Because you, yeah, you, you, you have, pick to, a you have to pick a profile. Right. I I will say, um, if you roll a one, it's generally as good or better to pick the hit profile on these units Math- rather than the rent. Mathematically, do you know how that works out? So uh, the basics are if you have a one up or two up to hit and you have exploding sixes, um, you hit with 100% accuracy because you, the ones all miss and the sixes replace uh, double up and replace the ones. <laughs> right. That right. And, and then what that means is for Boar Boy, for if, you, if you're playing an Ice Bone specifically, um, when you convert over into damage, you have more opportunities for more sixes to uh, right. roll, roll for mortal wounds. So, <laughs> no, you say it. You go. You keep talking. Oh, okay, I was. Well, you know, I'm just being polite here. I'm the, I'm the uh, host. Be... Okay, my job is okay. to shut up and listen. All right. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. So, <laughs> all right. So yeah, in, to Blade. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, y- y- if you're one, just. Roll, roll two up to hit, because if nothing else, I cannot describe to you how demoralizing it is to roll 40 attacks and come away with more than I started with. Because right. sometimes you just don't roll ones. And then you're like, oh, I'll roll 40 dice. All right, 40, uh, roll 40 attacks, and uh, that's 52 to hit. All right, now let's go to wounds. It, 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 it's, so, it's just wonderful. Yep. It's awesome. I'm a fan. Um, okay, so what other spells? I mean, I've seen, uh, having looked at your lists, I know that you use quite a number of these uh, Lore of the Savage Beast spells. <laughs> uh, just cross out Squiggly Curse. Just put a line through it. I don't want to talk about it. Don't want, it, is, it is Squ- Squiggly it, Curse just not You're not literally never going to take it. It's, li- it. it's awful. It sucks. Don't do it. <laughs> it's an embarrassment. <laughs> it, why does it, it, it? It's like they got to go. that spell and they were just like, I guess we have to put a third spell in here. And the intern was drunk when he was writing this part of the of the spell lore. It, it it's so nonsensical that it's just never going to come up. Why did they take away Breath of Gorkamorka and give us this garbage? <laughs> oh my God! Don't even. I don't even. <laughs> I, I I don't want to think of, oh of greener God. pastures here. This spell is terrible. Yeah. It, it's, uh, for those so of you that don't know, yeah, just, yeah, read just it. <laughs> for those Why? of you that are like checking out this video, but usually like you're like me, right, where you play the, the rest of the orcs, but not bone splitters so much. Uh, casting value of six. Pick one enemy hero within three inches of the caster. Okay, uh, that hero suffers D three mortals. If that hero is slain by those mortal wounds, you can add one to casting rolls for the caster for the rest of the battle. So that's a lot of conditions. You have to be within three. You have to not be a Wurgog prophet, because if you're a Wurgog prophet, you're staring. Like, I, even if you only have one wound remaining, I think you still spell. You still stare with a Wurgog, right? Like, mm, you would depends. never. You wouldn't cast. But 
in you wouldn't cast you wouldn't that. cast the spell. You would <laughs> you would never that. cast. You would stare instead of casting the spell. So you have to be within three of an enemy caster. You have to not be Wurgog. They have to you have to like you have to kill them and then plus one to cast. It's like who cares? Yep. Like who cares? Even if I get it, it's like okay, now what? But, to Calvin's point, just just you just use arcane bolt and then right. use your lore slots for a good spell. Right, because they could be within twelve or whatever. Right, but or in even, that even in that close, yeah. In that line that you were talking about of if your Wurgog's at one wound, um, there actually are times where you don't want to stare with your Wurgog, and that's where Gorka Morka's Warcry comes in. Um, a lot of times, either you rolled a bad laser roll, or they got, um, you know, they got a little aggressive with some shooting or something like that, and he just takes damage. Um, he can still heal up because we have lots of uh, the Wardock can heal. You have heroic recovery, and he's got a, a seven bravery instead of like the usual okay. destruction six. All right, that's, um, yeah, that's so. Better. Gorka Morka's war cry giving Gorka Morka's war cry giving a fight's last to someone within I think twelve is actually pretty useful for your army that can tend to be pillow fisted sometimes. So it can let you finish something off in combat if it's tied up with a couple of your units or your units are like at half strength because they've been slogging it out for a couple turns straight. So um, I take it on my wargogs generally because i will hit a point where there's a combat going on and the wargog's at like one wound and i don't i want another chance to heal him up right and you're casting glowy green tusks from other from another source somewhere well and he's a double caster too right yeah and, and uh, to follow up that uh Warger prophet's actually bravery eight i had to double check all right that. bravery eight you're right oh, wow. above it, average it, for destruction oh that's God, good he's so brave literally the most brave orc I think in the whole book. Um, seven wounds. That's what throws people for a loop. Is yeah. he's seven wounds. He's seven he's... wounds. He's a five up save, even though he's basically just got a loincloth on. It's great. Um, so the other thing is, is Gorka Morka's war cry is also really good on a maniac weird knob, because sometimes what you want to do is to put down, say, a big monster like Belcor, Mega Gargan, something like that. You can hero phase move with the fast done mount trait. Uh, the maniac weird knob get within 12, cast Gorka Morka's war cry, and then pile in your army on that one target and then kill it without having to worry about being struck back. Right, because you're playing a lot of small units. So if you're like, you strike mm -hmm. last, it means I'm going to strike with four units before you get to do your thing. Yep. Right. So Absolutely. You're, it's, it's more than just like, oh, you have to fight at the end. It's like, I'm going to pile up on you. Yeah, that's interesting. So it, it like it has de definitely sounds like it has some situational use across a few different situations. So, to be honest, like looking at this spell lore, pretty good spell lore, pretty good mm -hmm. spell lore. It's nice. How about power of the better. werebore? Power of the werebore is good for CP. It so it's plus one to hit, but they can't shoot, which doesn't matter because you're not taking arrow boys. Um, it's plus one to hit and plus one to run and charge. So it really helps with your denial game plan or the movement phase. You get to lean into that even more. Um, it helps you make charges to get onto points. So maybe that's not necessarily like to blow up a unit, although certainly that, but you can get into a unit and get like claim that objective if you weren't going to run that way or something like that. Yeah. Hit, plus one hit on a spell means you can save an all out attack somewhere else. Um, it's It's just a great generic buff spell if you have a surplus of casts which sometimes yep. you do hold it within 24 like it's good range yep it's it's great range especially when you're trying to tandem up like a unit of maniacs or <clears throat> even just the uh, uh the savage more boys on foot just giving them a free all attack and plus one to charge means you have some reliable delivery methods of your guys who normally move five inches you give them a buff um and with their musicians they're plus two to charge because all the musicians and bone slayers get plus one to charge which is an interesting concept because you know soul, soul screen bridge is you know bad now but hey <laughs> you know you take a ten, unit of 10 boar boys put them through a bridge with the power of the werebore on them and let them go nuts you stack it with bone spirit too suddenly yep. they're at plus one hit plus one wound without you having to use a cp or a triumph if that's the way you're going and so that can give that unit a lot more autonomy to go do whatever job you need it to do I yeah like it. and and it's it's pretty terrifying like the the if you layer all of your buffs into the 10 
more boys, you can get up to, and bear with me now, uh, an, a unit that, on the, if it successfully charges, is 41 attacks, 3 up, 2 up, potentially all the way from Ren 1 to Ren 3, if you have, you know, Horror Frost on them, and they get Exploding 6s. If they're an Ice Bone, their 6s to wound are Mortal Wounds, or if you're in Dragfoot, the only other good sub-faction, all those, all those successful hits ignore wards. So, That's you know, relevant. It's so much... That's very if, relevant. You, if you have never charged Gotrek with Dragfoot more boys, telling, reminding yeah. your opponent that this is what's about to happen to them is the greatest experience you'll yeah. ever have. Well, there's a lot of good wards out there right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to that when we talk about my my your drag foot later at some point but it's uh exactly i've charged gotrek with a reinforced unit of big stabbers that were all souped up in in drag foot and just like plowed right through his safe my opponent was very sad no kidding i was very happy <laughs> i hate that model uh anyway so uh anything else to talk about your your book spells or can we talk can we move on and talk about the um the i, I got spells? one more sure i guess I, so um Let's not forget, like, Mystic Shield. I know in Calvin's list, sometimes he takes, like, big units of just boar boys, like a 15 or a 10. That's a lot of wounds meant to pin something in. Um, I do that sometimes, too. And so if you stack, like, the, the War Dock can give plus one save, just like the, uh, the Swamp Call of Shaman. So if you stack that Mystic Shield all out defense, you can make something that's otherwise, you know, relatively squishy compared to a, a modern army. And really extend its durability, which is its job. It's there to go be in the way and make something not able to charge like it wants to. So yep. uh, definitely don't underlook uh, Mystic Shield, Arcane Bolt as well, if you plan on them getting, if they're going to come up into you and get into stair range anyways. Um, there's a no number of times where I just get into like really crappy wizard fights where like my <laughs> maniac weird knob has to go and run down like some stupid wizard in the corner and he just like fastens moves charges and then we have a, a slap fight and uh arcane bolt for that extra few mortal wounds really can do it sometimes yep absolutely and that's and that's the big thing about uh mystic top of that is you know everything in this army is a a five up save for those of you out there who you know probably don't think about the math a lot obviously this is warhammer not math hammer but if you take a six up save and you move that unit from a six up save to a five up save that's a 50 percent increase in survivability because that's just how the numbers run for that you literally double you literally double the survivability of army just by yeah. just by moving up one 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 bump well for, and so yeah. for those of us that play bad save armies when you don't get to make a save because your mm -hmm. opponent has ren two feels bad yep yep and so yeah, to, to blade's point you've got mystic shield in this army you've got the war dock who can give a plus one to save and then potentially have mystic shield so you could be uh, if you're a six up save you could be a five up save ignoring ren two yeah, you are still capped at the plus one, so if you're save stacking on your pigs, go ham responsibly. After all, we are yeah. After all, we are naked, so there's only so much you can do. But eh, you know, it's part cool. of the charm. Shall we move on to the seasonal spells? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So we talked about uh, Horfrost a little bit already, and how more rend is good. Any other thoughts on uh, on that spell? Right, one ups to hit. One ups to hit, right. man. Not very good on big stabbers. They're no, already yeah. like doing okay. Yeah. Really, you want it for like your your dual wielding guys, your maniacs. So, and so your, you're your telling me that Horfrost in, in Bone Splitters is really for the one plus uh, one up to hit? No, no, no. If you roll it, because remember for Horfrost you don't get to choose. No, I know. You roll but is, that, is that what you want when you roll? Like when you're rolling, are you hoping no, for a one? No, no, no. No. You're, you're rolling. You want the three rend. Oh, yeah. right. You want you want the three rend, but but a one is actually not that bad. No, 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 it's not. Um, I mean, mo everyone would be happy to hit on twos, right? So, but two, two rend is better than two to hit, but generally hitting on twos is better than the extra one rend for most units in this army. The only time that I would be happier with a 
three to uh, like a th like a th like th using the three for hoarfrost on to hit then then to ren is if you're charging your boar boys who normally hit on fours into a something that has minus one to hit because yeah. at best then you're hitting on fours but if you're right. hoarfrost and you're on threes instead then plus one minus one with all out attack then you're hitting on threes anyway that's really good so mm, that's I think you need to read Horfrost again, because I think it says it can't be modified further. It's the characteristic that can't be modified further. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, but the Oh, because roll... it hits rolls, you're right, right. Okay, I see. Yep. So, it, it, if there's something that says units are minus one to, like, minus one to hit to their characteristics, yeah. which I don't even think exists, but maybe it will. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, the rolls aren't affected. How about uh, Merciless Blizzard? Oh boy! Um, back up <laughs> back, back up Wargog for non Wargog wizards. You'll never take this on a Wargog. Just don't do it. If 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 someone if someone has walked into twelve inches of Wargog profit, they deserve what's coming to them. Uh, however, on a maniac weird knob, that's really spicy. Just because, you know, you can hero phase move them, then blow something up. It's even better on a war dock because then you have its blades point. A backup Wargog at that point. And then you just feed him all the spells and then go nuts. If You you know what? If you're spending 80 points, he could kill himself with Merciless Blizzard. It doesn't matter. You did it mm -hmm. anyway. He's it's 80, great. He's 80 points. He's 80 right. points. Right. It's like, yeah, I'll take two, please. Value Town. Thy name is, yeah, Warg Wardog. Yeah, he's great. I mean, Wizard Meta. I, th I think in this season... I think any super cheap, like, 80-point or under wizard is worth looking at. Yep. Yeah. And, again, Wardock can add one to your saves if he success or sorry, your casts, if he successfully dances. Yeah, so you can heal. put that on your, um, you can put that on your weird knob before he zooms off, and then you're at plus one in addition to your dice. Maybe if you take the obscure item, you could be at plus more, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, how about Rupture? This is a spell that I haven't really fully gotten a grasp on this season yet. I'm not really sure how I feel about it. So, the the nutshell is, is basically no one has an Incarnate at the moment, which is what you would really use them for. And most of the endless spells that we're talking about are... Uh, let's see here. Aether Void Pendulum's the big one that's always controlled. You have a Malevolent Maelstrom's, which will be usually cast, and then they'll explode pretty much instantly. There's some Geminids, but you don't see that very often. Basically, no one's playing Purple Sun at the moment, and all the other endless spells aren't controlled for the most part. There's some play, potentially, of taking this versus Zinch, with you know uh, demonic simulacrum and stuff but why would you ever why would you unless you're taking a warlord for the extra spell lores you know to get extra spells um why would you ever take this over for frost merciless blizzard or anything other than <laughs> squiggly curse and even then i if i'm i do take spell lore in i think both my lists and i do it for spell redundancy because your heroes die either they blow themselves up you send them off to get blown up or they just get shot or something like that yeah so yep. it's yeah i i agree there's the meta or the way the game looks right now isn't really set up for rupture unless you know not nine out of ten players in your meta are playing like zinch endless spells are already predisposed like you're already better at unbinding because you can unbind with your primal dice right mm -hmm. and if you're if the endless spell has to wait till the next turn to do anything then it's already like not going to do a lot of good i just don't see it fair enough how about um so how about you, you guys said that you wanted to do enhancements sort of all together yeah basically uh so, you know what blade why don't you take the command trait all right. Um, I think there are actually two choices here, um, but the one you're going to see in the huge majority of your lists is uh, Great Hunter, which is a Savage Big Boss only command trait. And your Tireless Tracker's ability is your units get a 5-up move before the game. Great Hunter changes that to an 8-inch move. 
So moving, you know, somewhere between four and seven units, eight inches, that extra three inches, it's pretty big. That unlocks yeah. um, the Wurgog pre-game stare, <laughs> uh, the, the, the dilemma in your opponent's eyes. Um, also, you know, sometimes you need those extra eight inches to get onto objectives. They allow you to effectively, like, defensively redeploy if you think you're going to, if they're set up to alpha you or something, or you can trick them. You can move a unit just to the other side of the board to help get there. It's the extra three inches adds a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot, but going five to eight is huge. So you obviously have to run a savage big boss. Yes, and that's usually why the only reason you see him in lists. Right, he's, um, he's here to do that one thing. Especially since he got a, a points increase a ways back. Ugh. When he was only 65 points, I would like take them in squads of four and have like a little like bro force. But now that he's back up to 80 points for some reason, you're just taking him for the command trait and he the command trait's worth 80 points. What's the other command trait that... Master of Magic! Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, I, I like Master of Magic because you don't always want to rely on your dice. And you do. You are still uh, an army that wants to cast a lot of spells with wizards who are kind of eh at it. A lot of factions have just better casting than we I do. I feel that. And uh, depending on your sub-faction and your build, like, you want those buffs. Um, you're, you're not typically aiming to go blow your opponent off the board. That's not really our game plan, but you need to be able to survive, which usually means you have to kill stuff. Yeah, or consistency with your most important buffs. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Master of Magic, Calvin? Uh, I think it's really good. Um, me personally, and I know this is coming up later too, um, I'm a big fan of the Antorian Acolytes Battalion, and because you have to choose to re-roll before you add primal dice and if you do so you can't add primal dice um i'm less big on it now you know for me the the one standout command trait from the uh, uh the new general's handbook command traits for entorian locuses is shaman of the chilled lands yeah just because i'm a big fan personally of maniac weird knob generals Mostly because they're significantly easier to kill than a Wargark Prophet, but they're also very mobile. They score uh, the one really good grand strategy for Bone Splitters really well. And sometimes, you know, what, what, what you really want is a wizard who can go and just constantly do things. You need someone to be a toolbox. And so if you take Shaman of the Chill Lands on a Maniac Weird Knob, then you can give him glowy green tusks as your spell lore and now he's going to know his really good war scroll spell he'll know glowy green tusks to make mounted attacks better which he can make his own mount attacks good in which case he can randomly yeah, kill things pretty finish well off, finish off a little unit somewhere yeah yeah and then on top of that he'll know horror frost he'll know merciless blizzard and then he'll additionally know rupture if that ever yep to score and that one battle he's a, tactic because he's a locust too if you're going second he, you can give him an extra cast Mm -hmm. right and suddenly you're like you know it's like oh i go up and i do this and i do that and you guys cry yep he makes him makes him even more useful than he is i like it how about anything else about command trait or command um traits or artifacts of power uh let's go to artifacts of power because there really isn't that much more about command traits yeah, like great hunter is a great hunter is fantastic like it really is it seems like um, if you're a new bone splitters player or like new to age of sigmar in general that great hunter is is the way to go like get good at using great hunter before you venture off from there i feel you you are absolutely right and i'll tell you this for uh great uh, i <laughs> uh there's uh, at nova one of my favorite tricks because i wasn't playing um one of the book grand strategies I was playing a different grand strategy. I would literally deploy my general on the back edge of my table, essentially. And all he was there was to enable the eight inch pregame move. And then his job was to never move and then be able to activate the wall. And there are a lot of times where people were like, oh, I'm going to, you know, teleport my guys into your back room, into your backfield. I'm like, no, you're not. And they're like, do you have someone back here? And I point at my general, and they're like, has he been here? Like, did, right. did he move at all? Like, nope. nope. He, he's been invisible the whole time. And people always forget about it. 
I mean, I, useful, right? Like that's some yeah. that's utility. Yep. He's and, so cheap that you don't so cheap and not that amazing in combat that a lot of times you don't mind just using him to sit back and block a teleport. And like you'd pay eighty points for the command trait, so the hero being a body is kind of a bonus. Literally, if this if if we went the like way of forty k and we had to pay for enhancement, I would pay eighty points to have Great Hunter. <laughs> Uh, I, straight up, it's so good. Artifacts right. of power. Artifacts of power. Let's talk about the big one. Chloe tattoo. The Yay. best artifact in the entire book. I I will fight everyone. I know Destroyer is really cool and all that for Iron Jaws, but Chloe tattoos sets up a War God Prophet to do things that really should never happen. So let, let, let's. Some of you probably don't know what a Wargog Prophet does, so let me explain. So, what a Wargog Prophet does, in detail, because I know we kind of glazed over it. At the start of your hero phase, if your Wargog Prophet is within 12 inches of an enemy unit, instead of casting spells that turn, or dispelling spells and all that good stuff, the Wargog Prophet can instead stare at that unit. And what you do is, is you roll a dice. On a three up, you deal D3 mortal wounds to that enemy unit. And on a one to two, nothing happens. However, after you've rolled, regardless of what the result is, you can keep rolling dice. And from then on forward, when you roll the Wargog Prophet Stare, uh, three ups or D3 mortal wounds to them, D6 mortal wounds to yourself if you roll a one or a two. Right, but then the four up ward cuts that in half. Yes. Right. So and you're you're effectively back to on a three up it's D three for you. On a two up it's D three for me. Yes. So theoretically, if you're looking at the law of averages, um, the average math when you run enough simulations, which there have been people who have done this, you're typically doing uh, up to eighteen mortal wounds. And they, because the important thing is, you this process continues until. Either you stop uh, the the stare prematurely, or the Wargog Prophet dies, or whatever you're staring at dies. Yeah, and the first Spoil stare is free, too. Exactly. So you won't take D6 on the first one. Uh, spoiler alerts, you're almost always just going to keep rolling the three up. because yeah, it's sick. It's, it's the most ludicrous thing in the whole game. It, it, yeah. the people... This is... Everyone, if you're going to play this army... At the beginning of the game, ask your opponent if they know what a Warhawk Prophet does. If not, be very clear with them. And then later, when they walk in the co the number of people who pile into combat with a Warhawk Prophet who has glowing tattoos on them, and then they're, and you're just like, okay, and blow up your opponent's stuff, and they're like, why did I do that? And you're yeah, like, I don't know I mean, why you did that. If like so, personally. I'm a very competitive player, right? Yeah. So I'm not, I wouldn't like, I'm not unsportsmanlike, right? Like, I, like obviously I'll be upfront and honest about everything. If I'm in a tournament setting, having never been in a tournament setting, right? And mm -hmm. and I was explaining what a Wargog does. What I would actually do is just tell them like, you should look at the Wargog mask ability on your on on the app. Like, look, read it yourself, and then let me know if you have any questions. Yep, because they, it's it's complicated, right? And you know you don't want to make an error in explaining it or conveying the information incorrectly. But it's like this is a thing worth worth looking at right now. Yeah, right. Like it's worth looking at right now for you. Do that. Yeah. Fair Spoilers. Warning. Stay outside of twelve. If he has one wound left on him, sure. But even then. You're, you're still not safe. The, the the theoretical damage cap is infinite for Wargog Prophet. Um, Blade, I'm curious, what's the biggest thing you've dropped to the Wargog Prophet? Um, Glotkin on the 5-up ward turn. My god. <laughs> that is impressive. Uh, and I've almost killed a Mega before. Yeah, I think, my, I think my single biggest from 100 to 0 is... Kairos died from full to zero without the Wargog taking any damage. I've done 24 mortal wounds to a Mega before, 
Um, a one GT, a Cherokee, I believe, a, either Cherokee or Nova. I think my one Wargog Prophet over five rounds did something like 180 mortal wounds. And there's no bad target, right? There's no, no bad target. It's like anything that's in 12, shoot. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter. Little foot uh, hero, horde. Maybe not, maybe yeah, not maybe 60 not zombies. <laughs> maybe not that. Right. But, but you can always <laughs> stop, right? Like, you can do it, and you can, like, if you're rolling hot, you're like, okay. Like, you can start staring with a Wargog Prophet if the only target is 40 zombies right unless i'm missing something you could just be like okay like i'll just start rolling and see what happens right i mean you give up your casts to do it so that's an evaluation you have to make Fair. some sure. targets have like i know archeon or varen guard are things i've struggled against because they have a four up ward versus mortals and so suddenly it's not such a profitable <laughs> trade so um it really not anything and that's why things like the uh the fights last spell are good because there are times where yeah stuff's in range but there's right. no good targets but like pretty much everything like almost everything i feel is good. yeah it, it, it's so rare to find a non-good target that most people they're just like ah, i'll put this unit there and at worst you're softening the unit up for maybe a unit of like maniacs or something yeah. to just finish them off and the war gog heals up nice too like you said like eight eight bravery is is really good and if in bone mm -hmm. spinners you're running that word dock like, you don't have to pick what dance you're doing before the game, right? Like, you have access to all three. As yeah, you play, every turn. Right? right, so you can just be like, oh, I'm going to heroic recovery, right? And that's a good probability of getting that heroic recovery. And then I'm going to do my... It's a three-up, right, for the for the healing dance? Yeah. Yes. Right. So it's not as good as a war chanter, right? His, the heal fix and beat is just... You just get to heal. D3, no, it's a three-up as well. So a three-up. Are you sure? Um, yeah. Probably, I'm probably just wrong again. Side Look. note. I'm a big, I, I do math hammer because I'm a nerd and it's fun. I made a simulation for probabilities of War Gog Prophet damage. Right. I'll share it to you in a chat so you can post it if you want. Sounds good. But... Yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> I was reading Fix and Beat the other day and I forgot to read the actual beginning of the War Beat section. Uh, yeah. yeah. And and War so Dogs stuff. fail to dance a lot. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. you really don't want them to. I'm 80 points, right? I mean, that's the thing. 80 points. If all they did was dance mm -hmm. for 80 points, they might still be worth it. Yep. Uh, just maybe, yeah. So it's... It, it, War Dog Prophet, it's the most fun you're ever going to have playing Age of Sigmar. <laughs> Hands down. It, it's it's so ludicrous. It's so much fun. And I'm telling you, this is part of the reason why Destruction is so much fun, because these moments where the War Dog Prophet goes nuts can lead you to some of your best memories you're ever going to have playing this game. Did we talk about him being a two-up ward in combat? Oh my god, we didn't. Okay, so <laughs> so so here's the deal. So the, what Glowing Tattoos does specifically is it adds plus two to the ward rolls for the bear, which in this case is a Wargok Prophet, right? So the Bone Splitter's WA sets the six-up ward to a four-up ward. And then if you have a Wargog Prophet in combat... That Wargog Prophet has a four board that they get plus two to the rolls on. So in combat, for that phase only, there are two up ward in combat. That must not come I, up a ton though, right? It, it it's rare, but when it does come up, it it's it's insane. Because sometimes what will happen is, is your opponent will charge, think they can kill the bone the the Wargog before it gets the stare off. You wa, they go up to a two up ward. They deal maybe a damage to it. Right. Your turn comes, and then you laser. I've killed Manfred that way. Yeah, it's the yeah. mind games, right? Bait them into it. Leave your Wargog so they can just get into it, right? And then they make this like overzealous, overextended charge to try and take out your Wargog before he can go nuts. And you're like, "Wow, okay, <laughs> yeah, we exactly." And Another side note, it's not relevant this season, it was relevant previous, and it may be relevant in the future, so it's worth saying. Um, anything that you roll to stop a, to negate a wound counts as a ward roll, and GW occasionally rules random things as ward rolls. So like in the previous season, Fueled by Gurish Rage, where on a 3-up you don't die, technically they, they came out and said that's a ward roll, so the Wargog would get plus, plus 2 to that 3-up roll. So in the future, you know, keep an eye out for weird little enhancements where you can modify the ward roll with the bear and it, it can catch people off guard or make it like weirdly powerful. Yep. 
Absolutely. Uh, it, it's it, again because we're dealing with an older book syndrome, similar to how Quartz is at the moment. Um, a lot of weird stuff is slipping through the cracks. Those weird interactions are really powerful because ward rolls, a ward roll of one does not automatically fail. It's one of the few things in the whole game where it right. doesn't automatically fail. So, a fuel by Gurish Rage, you got glowing tattoos. When that Wargog dies, stands back up. So, in the future, if things like that happen, like we get more weird stuff like that, great. And if not, four boards still really good. Big fan. Any other artifacts it, of power worth even considering? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> you're, well, you, you, you are always going to take low bar none. Like, do right. not. So, in, take, a, in a warlord not... in, uh, situation. Yes. So, okay. in the warlord situation, so there's two there's one in the book, and then there's one from the core rules. So, the one from the book is Mork's Bony Bits. Um, what Mork's Bony Bits, what the, 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 Mork's Bony Bits says is the bearer gets plus one to cast for each enemy monster within 24? Yeah. 24, yeah. So within 24. So there are certain armies where, you know, in, in a world where you have Zinch playing Guild of Summoners where they're constantly summoning Lords of Change, you can get to some pretty ludicrous casting values. Um, there's some Seraphon lists right now running like triple Bastilladon. You get within 24 of those, suddenly you cast better, usually for just that one spell, you cast better than a croak does. And it's and just, it's it, not even wholly within. Yeah, this right. one is. It's just Yeah, so you're, you're casting these ludicrous difference. spells. Yeah, and like if you get a Wargog Prophet within three of them and do you happen to have a horde unit? You fist a gork them at plus three. That means, you know, with 3d6 on the primal dice, yeah. you're usually casting at a 13. Well, and that's really high. Well, even without the primal dice, your average is going to be 10 at that point. Exactly. Um, right. I, last last year at Nova, um, it was really funny playing against Old Corn because Old Corn had an incarnate and three bloodthirsters. And so at one point, I was like at plus six to cast just from all the bonuses. And I'll be like, oh, cast, uh, that's a 16. And my opponent's like, sure, whatever, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, more so it, it, bits if you have a local monster meta. It yeah. is it, it is incidentally good, yes. Um, and then the other ones, and it's been changed a lot, but there is a really weird use case with Arcane Tome. Right now, um, pretty much everyone who plays Bone Splitters takes the Wall Grand strategy, which in a nutshell, what that means, is either your general or friendly battle line unit has to be alive and inside of your opponent's territory at the end of the game. So one of those two. Just got to be in their territory. There's a lot of big territory maps right now where it's pretty easy to sneak in. But the other one, and this goes back to the savage big boss thing of you put them in the corner and then you hide them and then you never talk about them again, is the grand strategy in the general's handbook which is the general that you have that's an Entorian Locus, as long as they're alive at the end of the game, you score it, right? So if you're in a Warlord situation, you put the Arcane Tome on a Savage Big Boss, you put them in right behind this piece of terrain, you never talk about them again, and a lot of times your opponent just straight up forgets about them. Because everyone's so focused on the Wargog, they're like, oh, the Wargog and stuff, and they don't think about it, and then suddenly they have to really work their their butts off to Sorry. get to that savage big boss what's the arcane tome for arcane tome turns a savage big boss into an entorian right. locus right and so then you, you okay. take the grand strategy of making sure your entorian locus general is alive at the end of the game so you That's call spicy. it i like that it's an arcane tome trick right yes. for a big boss uh with and what's what's that um grand strategy called Oh Lord, uh, can, it is called spellcasting savant. Spellcasting savant. Right. So it's just like a trick for your grand strategy, mm -hmm. right? It's like because if if you're gonna do this as a strategy, right, and you're taking a warlord, you could do an arcane tome savage big boss trick. Yeah. Yep. And that's a good way to get yourself three points, man. Yeah. yeah no, like I, it's I, I would like I'm using the word trick, but I don't mean that it's like 
silly or gimmicky or meme or anything, right? It's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if you're going down this this road, this suddenly becomes like a very legitimate option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and the other thing is, is it does open up the one tactic of you casting a spell and not having an unbound. If you right. with croak, you're not going to measure to your big boss, right, when they're doing their deployment. Yeah. You just put your savage big, big boss all the way in the back line, like outside 30 inches. I cast Arcane Bolt. Cool. Free two points. Yep, and I can't wait to talk about battle tactics, right, because I feel like a lot of players under appreciate how important it is to like have a plan for your battle tactics and score your battle tactics as a way as an avenue to actually win games right yep. people think that tabling your opponent is how you win but it's not yep it's not at all how you win Indeed. Uh, cool any other so other enhancements so for mount trait is it just fasten yeah it, generally it's the only one in the whole bone splitters book that can take well they're part of the book that can take mount traits is the weird knob you just want him zooming around the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Uh, any other enhancements? I guess that's it, right? Yeah. Uh, that's it for right now. That's it. So how about battalions? Blade, I know you love your <laughs> Warlord battalions, so go nuts. Okay, so I... I, I recognize that in in especially you know as as metas evolve the importance of being able to dictate when the turns happen is really good and in AOS generally being able to decide that is really really huge. Yeah, and I'm if you always have an eight inch pregame move. Yeah, yeah, I'm always a proponent for like trying to shoot for the two to three double turn if you can manage it. That being said, with my playstyle and because I like to be a bit more reactive with this army, I love Warlord. Um, I like to be able to counter deploy, not only from like a thing that I think is good, but that's an enjoyable way to play the game for me. I like the back and forth, the interaction in that pregame step. Um, I find the extra CP to be useful because there's always one turn where everything's a mess and having that extra CP is nice. And I always like an enhancement. Um, before this GHB, when I played Bone Splitters, I was like almost always double Warlord because there were cool and like uh, cool enhancements in the last ghb it's definitely a style right um you, you just play so many drops that you don't care and you're shaping your whole movement game with great hunter and move assuming that you're gonna have to take the first turn anyways so you can bake that into how you deploy meanwhile your opponent just kind of like showed their cards and is up to your whims that being said, if you're going for like an alpha pinning strategy, Warlord might not be the best bet. Correct. I think this is another one of those important moments where you, you as the player need to decide ahead of time what it is you're trying to accomplish with your list. Mm -hmm. Are you doing plan A or are you doing plan B and so on? Yeah, I think the the value of this battalion will change based on what enhancements are available in each season or whatever that looks like in the next edition, since this is the book we're playing for the rest of the edition, right? So, uh, yeah, this season, it'll, it'll... It seems like a no-brainer to go with the spell enhancement, I feel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Especially because we have a bunch of casters, and there's a bunch of good spells. In in your book and out. Yes. And, like, you, were, you made this point before about redundancy, right? Mm -hmm. Your two casting Wurgogs are going to be aggressive, and are going to die or not cast spells, right? Because mm -hmm. they're going to be staring instead. So, and having a two cast Wurgog, it's nice to have another really good spell on his list as well. Yeah, yeah flexibility, right? Especially because, again, I, I really like that reactive play style, and I think Bone Splitters really leans into it. And having a larger pool of tools to employ um, is good. Use it. Take advantage of it. We have good spells. Lean into it. But would you, Calvin and Blade, would you say that Battle Regiment is really the first choice? Or the most common choice? The most popular choice? Would you say that Battle Regiment might be the easiest choice if you're starting out with the army or struggling to win with the army? Hmm. So, um, here's what I'll say. If you want to play the simplest possible version of Bone Splitters, like if, you, if you've listened to this whole thing or read anything that I've written <laughs> and all that stuff, if you want to play the simplest version of this army, it is by far um, you take Kragnos, a bunch of pigs, Orgog Prophet, and you slap it into Battle Regiment. Just because 
you, you, you get to hit hard with a really hard hammer with Kragnos and stuff. You get to dictate priority. Bone Splitters, most of the time when people play with Battle Regiments, they're almost always going second, unless they have a really good reason to go first. Bone Splitters really wants to go first to maximize positioning and to make your opponent's choices very, very, very difficult. Uh, because Bone Splitters doesn't have the way to just push people off of objectives like some other armies do, like a lot of other armies do. So instead, proactivity, positioning, the movement phase is where Bone Splitters really, um, in my opinion, in the way I play, which we'll get to list here in a second, uh, the battle regiment's really impactful for them. Now, that said, I have played I, I this is i played both versions uh at cherokee last year i played uh the battle regiment with kragnos did really well with it and then at nova i played i went from one drop to 14 drops with double warlord and all that good stuff and you know that's blade's point countering counter deployment is very strong with bone splitters just because you start opening up these weird choices where your opponent's looking at all these these, these fairly cheap units who don't hit very hard but now they're controlling the flow of the battlefield in a way where your opponent has to do something about them in order to you know operate like a normal army would so battle regiment i think is the simpler path if you want to reduce your decision making um to much simpler choices you would go with there if you're not worried about that and you like the counter deployment strategy Warlord, uh, Bone Splitters probably does it better than anyone else, other than I don't know, Soul Blight, I guess, just because of the number of bodies we're talking about here. Um, I like Battle Regiment. I, I like simplifying my, my thinking, especially when I'm playing five rounds. Speaking of which, playing five rounds of Bone Splitters and doing well with it is the most rewarding thing in the world. Uh, factual, like actually true. <laughs> Yeah, this was something that came up in my interview with um, with Aaron about how playing Cruel Boys is going to make you a better player, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to maximize all of the value that the army gives you. You can't rely on one aspect to win. You have to maximize it. I feel like it, by playing and understanding and learning how to play Bone Splitters, you're really going to understand the movement phase of the game and space denial right and it'll make you a better player right it'll uh, make you a better player your your tools are so much different both what you don't have access to and do have access to and so it, it gets you to look at the game differently i think awesome okay so um, anything else about sorry, go ahead Blade. acolytes oh yeah, 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 acolytes. Yeah, yeah acolytes yeah great i was just ready to move on from that I, I would typically be double warlord, um, but usually there's more enhancements. <laughs> um, and the, the, the extra artifacts we talked about earlier, they're pretty good, not as enticing. And just when I was making lists, I, I just ended up on five heroes a lot. Um, and that's just, that's not enough for a warlord, but it, it is enough for Antorian Acolytes. And, you know, having those extra dice for dispels is most important, but also to help you get off your buffs for our, our mediocre casters. Awesome. Just gas. Absolutely. It I Antorian Acolytes is such a good battalion. Like it, it's it's so low impact for bone splitters, especially if you're going high drops. It like it doesn't matter. And like now because you don't have to worry about playing with a sixth hero, that opens up points for an extra unit to take or potentially even a good endless spell or you know in some cases fighting for the triumph bit so the Antorian acolytes even in my list like it, you know blades like what's a drop who even cares right me i'm probably I, i'm breaking out of the one drop mentality and moving to three drops and that's an important point because pretty much everyone right now if you go and look at a lot of the the meta lists right now um, outside of some specific factions, most people are taking at least the Antorian Acolytes Battalion. Yeah. And with two wizards in it, 
and then at best they're in a three drop with a battle regiment which yes. is what my list is in and and so you're not that far behind the getting uh, be, to being able to dictate priority correct i have a one drop iron trust list right now that runs a null stone adornment and mm -hmm. i get to go i get to pick all the time nobody yep. nobody's a one drop right now and that's that list is is good i think for that reason because no one's one drop and you're you're gonna get to dictate Mm -hmm. uh, in that yep. in that list which which is awesome brief aside this is the coolest general's handbook ever yep yeah agree very happy and i'm happy that it's the first one that we get for a year i'm happy Hallelujah. With that. right yep i get to sink my teeth into this for sure big fan anything else about battalions or should we move on to allies so uh... I, I guess for people wondering i looked at i did some math on the wizard hunter one I'm like, well, you know, we've got, like, big stabbas. Maybe if you're able to jam, like, your random big boss and some big stabbas into this battalion and go hunt down some wizards, nah, it's still not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Do, do, if, if you could take mounted units, uh, then just don't ever play it. Just don't if you could it. take big stabbas in sixes still, oh my then God. I might give it more pause. Please, <laughs> give it back to me. Uh, Yeah, let's talk about allies. Yeah. Uh, so, um, there's really, in case you don't know, the only allies that Bone Splitters can take are either the Mercenary Mega Gargants or Gloom Spike Gets. So, um, I'm a big fan of the allies here. Uh, I think Blade's more of a purist, personally. Um, so, there's two things. One, Horfrost makes units like the Gatebreaker Mega Gargant, which is a big drog of Fort Kicka, which no one ever remembers that name, right? But, a, like, a Gatebreaker normally hits on fours. And in Sons of Bama, you don't have access to take Horfrost. Well, in Bone Splitters, you do. And suddenly, you can make this guy who's hitting on fours to twos. And that's really efficient, just being able to go out and do things and on the finest hour turn he can really put the hurt on a unit um and so it, it's interesting to me to be able to do that kind of thing and megas are a wound sink that deal damage they they have uh they turn off inspiring presence they force battle shock on people they are a very needed access sorely needed access to roar because this army has no access monsters outside of allies except for Kragnos but at 470 points a, a gatebreaker mega this is great value uh, you can even play a war stomper at 400 points 35 wounds for 400 points that you can buff up with Horfrost or just a mystic shield really good it's really efficient and conveniently uh, mega gargan allies because they fit in a hero slot, fit really neatly into a leader sub, a leader slot for a battle regiment. And in addition, they're usually the only people on the table on your side that you can give the extra command point to for the Antorian realm rules of a pick, a pick a hero. And if it's not a locust, they get an extra command point. Because boy, oh boy, does this army suffer from bravery. Um... The other really big one is Gloom Spike gets Scragrot we mentioned earlier is just he's a lot of fun. He gets plus one to cast. He's got a laser beam. Yeah. So you could pair him up with a Wargog Prophet. It's cool. The other one that really comes up is, and this is what I'm interested in here, is the unconditional battle line for Gloom Spike gets, which are Stabas, Shudas, Squig Hoppas, and the squig herd so the trick to that is the wa grand strategy for orc war clans you have to have your hero your the your general or a friendly battle line unit wholly within your opponent's territory at the end of the game um unconditional battle line because they're not dependent on anything you can use them to score that grand strategy so if you have a unit of squig hoppers who are just table running corners and stuff easy way to score a grand strategy um stabas hilariously when they're untouched can steal objectives at 20 at you know 120 points for 20 models um 
shooters are there they exist but, but they're just in squared hurt or squared hurt uh fun fact you can double reinforce allied unconditional battle line units because they're still a battle line so that if you really <laughs> yeah so if you want to take a block of 60 stabbers go nuts but would you yeah probably not. not in that it, like yeah probably not no but hey, that's that's something you can experiment with. If you go out there, friends, and you take 60 Stabas and a Bone Splitter's army, and you slap Horfrost on them, I don't know, man. It, it can get spooky quickly. But, you know, that's just my beef. I like allies a lot. Uh, I... Blade, I think you don't. <laughs> I A mix. So, um, part of it is I put a lot of time and effort and emotion into converting a mm -hmm. significant portion of my defense splitter's army um so i like to play with all my my big dumb green guys that i've converted in a million ways however um i i actually want to jump on the the way you did allies and do it backwards kind of starting where we were so stabas uh one of the lists i wrote uh has stabas because one of my heuristics that i like to go through in the meta right now is that um uh, minus one to hit is way better than better than better saves most of the time. There's a lot of units that rely on being at threes. Um, the game nowadays is less about just roll sixes and more about have your opponent roll ones. And so, you know, when they've, they're coming into 20 wounds, five up save, which is the same as 10 savage boys, right? Um, with the minus one to hit, they're bonus against shooting and they get like i think they get to plus one to run rolls or something like that from their musician like they're a neat little screen they're a wide screen um and can run around grab objectives they have the nine inch grab they're they're useful um they help fill some gaps where bone splitters is kind of falling behind I, I, that that minus one to hit i've noticed it on my gut rippers i've noticed it on stabas it's, it's so good um, and they got so much better because mm -hmm. previously you had to measure it now you don't like are you in range good cool i don't i, I don't have to do math it, i played that at lvo with the clean spike gets rules and having to measure netters mm -hmm. is the worst experience ever but they still did a lot of work for you at lvo if i remember correctly they they sure got <laughs> in the way of things <laughs> For a hundred, for like uh, whatever, however many points they were, they sure got in the way of things. And there's, a, there's honestly an argument to your point of taking the Gobble Palooza too, because they have a minus one hit, the minus one hit spell mm, on yeah. top of that. Um, other things I'm looking at from Gits, uh, one of my lists I was really flipping back and forth between a unit of uh, Fellwater targets, just because mm -hmm. um, some sub factions are less good at dealing mortal wounds. And so when you have to force your way through saves, like big, big armor factions can be hard for this faction to deal with. And so getting that rend or, st or stopping the save bonus can be pretty big against some units that can really stack it up. Um, mm -hmm. So especially some that are stacking and stacking like OBR or, you know, they're getting in there with like super defensive knights or something like that, or a, a hero that's back to the nine with best day ever and stuff like that it's it, being able to shut that off and having some kind of ranged component may be good they're okay they're a little tanky they do more damage than a couple of big stabbers uh, i haven't tried it out yet though something i'm looking at snarl fang riders i don't know i i get it i'd rather take boar boys i'd rather just take boar boys they're just better like yeah. the six inch pylons cute but you know, we we have a way to just put a four up ward in the combat phase. Like mm -hmm. eh. corner tagging is not as good at, not as good anymore since you, you really got a lot of value out of if forty millimeter bases are bigger, only having one inch reach. But now, not so much. Like you are like you don't want to corner tag zombies because you give them free. You don't want to corner tag Kernoff because they just kill them instantly. So, like, they're really neat, but Boar Boys just do the same thing, but better. Which is not words you usually hear 
<laughs> they need a Sigmar, uh, but they do. <laughs> they, 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 they do in this very specific case. And so, of course, Scragrot. But yeah, the, Scragrot. Oh, right. He's just good. He's good. He's, he's good. I really like the Fort Kicker. Like, I think I that's have one great. more Gargan I want to shout out. Um, probably a year ago, Peter Atkinson, Plastic Crack, shout out. They make good articles. You should go read them. Um, <laughs> uh, he wrote an article about um, if you know the pack ahead of time and are able to design lists, um, crack, you can build a list around a Kraken Eater. Remember, a big part of our plan is to control space and just cap objectives early. So if you mm -hmm. can get a Kraken Eater to kick objectives up the board and move your kind of wall forward closer to the other objectives so you're less spread out, you might be able to leverage that. And it's a concentration of wounds. They do some damage. Uh, definitely something that might be worth considering um, depending on how things go or how you like to play. Yep. And uh, honestly, like he, he's he's pretty darn good as a uh, in combat as well, since uh, his his whole shtick is he can he can give himself fight last plus one to hit and wound. And then his entire profile is twos and twos, which is really efficient. And he picks um, up three models or D3 models, which gets around that whole armor problem that we have sometimes. Yep. And there's a lot of problematic like undercry, uh, underworld war cry war bands where <laughs> like you have these like the, the flesh eater courts for old beast players. If you haven't played yet, it's coming. But <laughs> the, the, the leader dude for that unit just randomly has three damage and the, the you know, or the uh, you play against Lumineth and the, the high sentinel or the high warden and you just pick them up and they can't cast spells with them anymore and other unit champions dead so like it, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there um by the way that article that i those two articles i keep talking about you can also find them on plastic crack uh check it out if you like seeing australians talk about drinking beers at games it's great see the link in the description <laughs> yeah right click here hey, i'm supposed to say that Oh yeah. Well, no. click click this first, so, then click that later. Grand strategies. So, wa. That's the big one. And then we also talked about the. Um, so like, wa is your default, and then what was the other one called again? I can't remember. Um, if that's situational. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I I okay. Let's talk about that real quick before we get into the the ones that are actually good. So. Yes, we have a grand strategy for bone splitters. And what it says is after deployment, pick one terrain feature wholly within enemy territory. When the battle ends, you complete the strategy if you control that terrain feature. Granted, we all play, there's a number of different ways that in a tournament uh, you could have terrain uh, in your opponent's deployment zone. But the fact is, is we live in a world where people could take 160 zombies. You're not killing 160 zombies. You're just not going to do it. So, I just... Have you ever actually scored that blade? Yes. Oh my god, you're a champion. I don't... I, it's not my favorite. Uh, Wa is generally better. But I think, yeah... You know, Calvin and I are both TOs. Read your pack. Know yeah. what's coming up. And um, your option, you may have more options available to you with context. Um, generally, you, you're designing your list around your tactics and grand strategy, not just what you want your army to do. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you'll usually manufacture a way for WA, spellcasting, savant, something like that to be the better choice. I have but, a feeling uh, uh, most players pick their list based off what models they happen to have. <laughs> sure yes uh and here's the thing again if you're if you're playing tabletop and you're just wondering how do you play better with this army versus like your friends and stuff and you're playing with what you got get them bones is perfectly fine you just have to come to the gentleman's agreement that at least one terrain feature is wholly with opponent's territory because if it's even out it's not within it's wholly within so there could be times where that just doesn't happen. So just be mindful of that. Just pick a wah. <laughs> just pick just just pick wah. Spellcasting Savant with the big boss artifact was the other really cute one. Um, other than that, just pick wah. It's 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 it's, it's so good. straightforward and it's so good and it reduces there's a lot of missions 
um, this GHB where your opponent's territory is half of the table. And that just makes it easier to score it. And we don't have any with really tiny deployments like we did in the last one. Yeah. With, when, with like the Realmstone cache where you have oh, like a tiny God. little rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, love good. Uh, you're, you're, I, you're not wrong picking it. Much like Great Hunter, if it's your, your default, right, then you're usually good. Looks like we lost Calvin real quick. Yep, so we're good. All right. Okay. How about battle tactics? So okay. We can talk about the book ones first. So what I'm curious about battle tactics, I'm curious about two things. One, like if they're good, like if I should even really be thinking about them when I'm playing or how much I should be thinking. And two, at what phase of the game, like roughly what turn am I looking at to try to score these? How do you feel about the book tactics played? So, I, I've been playing Big Wall recently, and I get time to get stuck in a lot. Uh, it's, it's, I don't rely on them. Kill the Biggin was awesome back in the Monster GHB. Now it's, I, I get it a surprising amount of the time, but I, you can't plan on it. Um, same with Destroyer of Empires, have Kragnos destroy a piece of terrain, which you get the monster section, and you also get his Ow, You Hurt Me roar that might destroy some things. But it's, again, it, a three up. It's a, so unreliable. Um, a time to get stuck in may be good depending on your build, right? Or your yeah. opponents. Or, or you just end up that way, right? Like they're playing KO and they charge their army into you. And yeah. now you're like, well, I, I'm here anyways. <laughs> yeah, because here's the thing. Uh, time to get stuck in. Uh, if you out there, please make sure you reread this tactic because it's very particular in how you score it. Your models, your friendly models, all of them, including your general, uh, they all have to—they all have to be within twelve inches of an yeah. enemy unit. It's not, so it's not unit; it's model. Yeah. Yes. Which makes and it really tough. You can be absolutely at the mercy of a redeploy and that's sometimes just completely unreliable now your opponent could just charge you and just make your life simpler if you're just duking it out in the middle but it's, it's not a well-rounded tactic yeah i've i failed this more than i scored it you can um, stumble into them yeah you, you, you definitely can. can and it's only in rounds one and two so yeah um killed the big one. uh reread this one because a wargog laser does not score this one Status. You got to kill it in the combat phase. So just yeah, made that. by attacks, right? Yep. Not not by spells or by abilities, but by attacks. Correct. Yep, absolutely. And then destroy your empires. Just to go back to what Blade is saying, you have to a have Kragnos, which is a very restrictive build of Bone Splitters, God. which I like and I play it. But you also have to have your opponent. Your opponent has to have faction terrain, and you've got to get Kragnos next to it, which isn't always easy. It's so. such a bummer. You know, there's only three. There's only mm -hmm. three in the book, and one of them is if you're playing Kragnos. Yeah, and... It's like, they're so... And they're so poor. And, that's you bone know, splinters, baby. That, that's bones. We don't, we don't need no book tactics. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I will say this, um, and this is... If you've read the Battle Scroll, you caught up on this. Both Iron Jaws and Cruel Boys got new tactics... But Bone Slayers didn't, which is a massive bummer because uh, in case you guys aren't aware, one time this army, which we talked about having horrible saves, just being the tail end, like the very beginning of third edition, you know, the book's kind of outdated at this point. Uh, Bone Slayers was top of the meta for a few months. It, it, it was played by like two dozen people worldwide, but it would crush events just because it's, it was really efficient. And then everything in the army that was good got points increases, mm -hmm. and it's not changed since then. Um, you know, I got to play it at Nova right before the points increases. It was really good. And then the list I took in Nova went up 300 points. Straight yeah. up. And that's just, just a killer. And it's, it's backbreaking. And so that's why if you look at the meta representation, it's really low competitively, I think mostly because this past two GHBs haven't been very kind to them, 
And that's why this, you know, I'm glad we're talking about it now because I, I really do think this is the time to get back into Bone Splitters because I, I, I think there's a lot of play here. Anyway, that's that's me being salty. I'm not gonna, I mean, we're, we're not gonna bring this down. But the battle tactics, the book tactics, suck. They're okay. okay. No, they suck. They suck. I'm trying to be positive no, here. No, I think it's I think it's more important to be honest. Yeah. Right. I mean, like I like the whole thing. Pause. Like, so you're talking to a cruel boys player here, right? <laughs> right. So, like, it's important to stay positive and and say to yourself, like, well, like you can win, right? Like you can win. You'll you'll learn to play better if you play this army, right? Like you, if you love the faction, like you should get good at it and play what you love, and you can be a better player. Like, I think that people overestimate the faction and the list and they undervalue themselves as the player, right? Good players win tournaments, mm -hmm. not good lists. It's the it's good players. So yep. if you get better, if you as a player get better, you'll, I mean, you'll get better, right? Like you'll win more, right? Mm -hmm. So focus on that. I think that's the, the like the staying positive thing, right? But like yep. this list of battle tactics is terrible. Like it's awful. There's you, only you, three of them, and one of them is if you're playing Kragno, so there's two of them, and, mm -hmm. like, they suck. And you don't even, like, one of them, like, they might not have monsters, right? So yeah. You might well, have exactly. one. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, I, like, you're not going to alpha strike me. Uh, I'm planning on leaving my dude in the back line, so time to get stuck in is gone. You don't have a monster. I'm not playing Kragnos. GG. Right, I, I think I things look up know. when we get into the GHB ones, though. Let's do it. I think it. things look a little better. GHB. Uh, Quick, quick side note: If you kill, or if you kill uh, Nagash this season in combat with a Bone Splitters army, tell me, like, find me on Discord, whatever. I w I will pay, however much, to, <laughs> to ship you a case of beer because you deserve it. Noted. For killed the big ones specifically. <laughs> Blades like bet. I think right. unlocked. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's let's talk GHB tactics. Okay. Um. So there's a lot of these are a lot kinder to bone splitters than they were last season. That that's my estimation. How how are you feeling about them, Blade? Absolutely. I I was surprised when I looked through these and I was like, I I, I want to do a lot of these things anyways. <laughs> yeah, like I'm I'm basically going to be doing these anyway. So I, I I guess let's just go down the line here. So let's start with intimidate guys. You have an eight inch pregame move. You, you for half just, your army. <laughs> for half your army. The, literally half your army. You are almost guaranteed to be doing this turn one every single game. S tier. It's so, it, it, S tier. S plus yeah. auto right. score. So uh, the way that I use like these systems, right? S is like you're going to do it every game. And it's going to be easy, right? Yep. A is like you're either going to do it every game with a little bit of work or you're going to do it most games with like it'll be easy but it's not going to be a guaranteed every single game right but it's it's super easy to get b is like situational right so it's it'll be good when it's good it'll be good but when it's not it'll not even on your mind c is you can technically score it and then f is like like it's actually impossible for for the army like we don't actually have the tools to do this tactic right so yep intimidate the invaders s tier yeah, oh, yeah. It, this this GHB from practice, like I I've been preparing Big Wall for a team event, and it is so critically important to know: can you score a tactic turn one if you have to go first? And if you can't, you need to reevaluate your list. So intimidate is just with the pregame move, especially if you have boar boys, it's you're going to do it practically every game. So when when you're deploying and when you're thinking about like your game plan for the game, this when you're deploying you need to keep this in mind. Right? Yep. It's like so all these are the units that are going to be wholly outside, right? So I'm going to start measuring my 5/8 slash eight inches right to make sure that they all can and you know, good to go. How about reprisal? Um I mean that's so a situational a one, right? It is, um, and this is a funny one, if only because uh, you got to be really careful with how it reads, because very specifically, uh, reprisal has to do with killing enemy an enemy unit that killed your general. And now, 
heads up, it's not the model pick to be your general. It's just a general. So if you have Kragnos who's a war master and Kragnos dies before your regular general does, you could still score a reprisal on whatever killed Kragnos. However, uh, this is really important. If your Wargog Prophet is your general and he blows up with his Wargog stare, uh, you can't score this tactic. Right, because so an enemy just, didn't do it. Exactly, so please remember that. Cool. I, I, I also want to say something that leans into this is a lot of times, you know, we've said you're taking that big boss and his his importance kind of drops off after, well, what, turn one? <laughs> when turn one starts. <laughs> um, so in the, in the mid game, when there's like a lot of attrition going on and your big boss is kind of running around, like uh, it's not uncommon for me to just slap best day ever on him charge him in somewhere and try and get a couple of extra points in a in an important combat and then he'll end up like dying like at that point he's done a lot of the work and then you can kind of like set yourself up to lean into this tactic uh by throwing away your general if he starts to drop off in usefulness kind of mid to late game yep uh just as a reminder if you take spell casting savant do not do that yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah don't 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 do that but just wanted to put that caveat out there otherwise I have suicided many of Savage Big Boss. Uh, I like to imagine they were screaming, witness me, as, a, as they charged in. Endless expropriation. Uh, I mean, it's a thing you can do. It exists. The likelihood of this ever coming up is incredibly low. Uh, I've played like 30 games in this new GHB because I'm a psychopath. And... I have never done this tactic. So technically possible, but like not really going to happen C tier? Yeah, you need very specifically either someone taking an incarnate, which no one is for the most part, or you play against someone who has an endless spell that isn't malevolent maelstrom, essentially. That can be, that's predatory. So yeah, you could do it. If, if you if someone ends up doing that please let me know because i have yet to see anyone do this one but magical once this season we, we talked it, about magical dominance already right yeah and we talked about this in combination with the savage big boss arcane tome backline which mm. to be honest like like seems act pretty good like that's yes it, it seems to there's a lot of value that you're adding up one thing at a time right <laughs> Yeah, and that's a lot of how Bone Splitters works. It's just building these incremental values until it becomes something that your opponent can in, is is insurmountable. So, it this is, it's yeah, it's an S tier with the Arcane Tome Big Boss trick. Otherwise, if you know if your opponent's wizards are dead, then it's pretty good. So, like so a B. or you leave I'd, someone outside, right? I th I'd say I'd say A or B. Yeah, um, I do want to bring this up though because this this is important. Um, you'll find everyone that your opponents who have lack of another good turn one tactic, they're going to try to do the thing where in deployment, they deploy their heroes all the way on their back line as far away from you as possible. And if you're planning for that as the bone splitters player, and you have the tireless trackers, uh, great hunter combination of moving eight inches, you can move your war guard profit eight inches into the center of the table or closer to within 30 inches of those, of those wizards. And now suddenly you could potentially deny that tactic to them. Ruin their day. Be super yeah. friendly when you do it, but ruin their day. Yeah. Cause some people are really, some armies are really reliant on getting them off turn one. And if they can't, you just denied them two points. Another reason why Great Hunters or Tireless Trackers is so good. Lots of reasons. Yep. Magical Mayhem. So I assume this doesn't work with the word Gog Stare. No, because it's spells and endless spells, but you know what it does work with? Merciless Blizzard. <laughs> right. But you're at the mercy <laughs> of, uh, did you actually cast that spell? So right. But it's just an mo interesting thought, right? Because you're like, okay, this spell I'm going to Blizzard or this tournament of Blizzard. It's like, okay right yep. so it's worth you know keeping in mind it's like when you're gonna you know because uh, i've looked at your lists and blizzard is in them yep right I, I think you can lean into it a little bit um 
there's some of those like magic weak ish armies and so you could do something like jaws i was mm -hmm. considering that for a while i've i've in the past used jaws to annihilate some like units of chosen or those foot slogging guys yep. um or uh pendulum i guess is another one that you could finish off units with it's a little tricky like you'd want them to be on like one or two wounds but um blizzard's your best bet yeah because yeah. in, in this army a lot of your spells to me i uh, feel like buff spells right and the, they are the war scroll uh spell for the wargog right it's it, you're only going to roll the number of dice equal to the number of models so it's going to be difficult to finish off a unit using mm -hmm. that spell um scrag rot right if you're running a scrag rot this spell gets a lot or this uh, battle tactic gets a lot stronger yep yep and and then i i guess there's edge cases where you have like a maniac where knob you cast arcane bolt on him and then you charge him into a some something that's got three or less wounds but even then you're still like it, it's it's super risky you could just miscast it's you you try to pick tactics yeah. that don't re, that don't rely on dice rolls yeah or like you're going second and at the beginning of your turn you know that your opponent has already spent all their primal dice but you haven't yep right it's like there's situations it's like oh my uh, maniac has you know i'm gonna give him op optimal focus plus one cast I have fasten. I'm gonna fasten. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this other spell. I'm gonna blizzard and throw all my dice at it, right? Like there's yep. there's moments where it'll it'll come up. Yep, uh, bait bait and trap to me seems like a pretty good one in this army. Uh, yep, because if you, if you have a like if you play like Blade does, who have a million units, you're they're gonna be in combat eventually. Four board, make sure that they survive to be in combat to retreat from you're gonna do this one a lot with bone splitters would you say it's s tier like are you are you pretty much gonna guarantee this every game or would you say it's an a tier where it's like most games this is likely going to happen on a i i would call it a yeah i i would stick it with a you're not gonna do this every single time um but it is definitely an option um it, it, and, and by an option i mean you're gonna do this you will do this a lot just not every time the, the caveat is this tactic gets worse the longer the game goes on as the number of units on the battlefield start to diminish. Right. So it's like a turn two, turn three. Like I committed my first units and now I'm going to pull them back for some rallying and commit my second line of units. Yep. Or you're, exactly. you're pulling your screens to the side so that you can deliver your hammers. Yes. Something yep. like that, right? Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. How about led into the maelstrom? Um... This one seems trickier because all your heroes are wizards. Except yeah. for a throwaway big boss. Except for a yeah. throwaway big boss. Yeah. Throw throwaway big boss. Hey, it's not a throw. Like, like to play a, a cheap unit for the expressed purpose of completing a battle tactic is a legitimate thing. When I was talking to Aaron about Cruel Boys, his list right now runs two kill bosses. Or, sorry, two Nash Tooth. Kill boss on Nash Tooths. It's just for battle tactics. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's He's like, this. It, the battle packs and the. Battle tactics dictate that this is the playstyle. I I feel like there's a lot of times, too, where it's like they, I mean these are games of attrition, and they really come down to sometimes there's just a few sparse units, and you're gonna want to throw like your wargog into a fight anyways. Yeah. Uh, and he, I mean, like like we said earlier, uh, an ice bone, your your six of the wound do mortal wounds, and sometimes you spike those and do like six damage on your wargog or something it happens well but, and he's he can be tanky right you charge him in and then you wa and you're on a two plus ward uh, yeah at minimum he's gonna survive so i th this one this one i definitely think you're gonna do mostly because you can get a weird knob to charge things that aren't gonna just kill him outright and if you do it on a wall turn at one of those two units the battle line or the uh the hero that you're charging with will, will live well, and you've said it yourself that most, I think that the standard default player uh, is probably going to be running a savage big boss with great hunter, uh -huh. right? So, led into the maelstrom. Yep. Right? Yep. There you go. So he, and again, we're stacking up all this value now on this eighty point unit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what That's was worked. the other one that we talked about? Yeah, I mean, you could go with the arcane tome, right, for the battle tech. But I, I think that most players are probably. I'd, I'd say like a, a very default bone splitters list is going to be savage big boss with great hunter mm -hmm. right oh sure. here 
and you're kind of double dipping because great hunter gets better the more units you have because yep. it's half of your units yeah. rounded up right so he's another he's adding to that count to give you that another right. uh another move yep and battle tactics all kinds of good stuff yeah i mean mm -hmm. he's great how about surround and destroy i get this one almost seems like s tier to me yeah absolutely this is mm -hmm. like between this and intimidate you're you're gonna get this like probably the first two turns of the game it's probably gonna be intimidate followed by surround just because there are some maps where surround is really annoying to score like um like the ice fields but beyond that though like you have a pre-game move of eight, of eight inches yep you could be playing boar boys who move 12. you could just run units and stuff well, right but you know Except... it's coming right like you know you have your plan you know yep. you're gonna be like i'm gonna move out of my thing awesome turn two i'm gonna do this other thing awesome you know now i'm looking at bait and trap i'm looking at um yeah i mean led into the maelstrom you know if exactly only, if right now so i'm playing big wa right now um and i'm so happy that i have two book tactics that are pretty much guaranteed every every, every game that yep. makes is a huge difference for me if bone splitters had w one or two book tactics that were s tier or even a tier i think that you would have such an easy time scoring five every every game Agreed. Like, you would be such a better you would be such a better army if you just had one or two book tactics i it mm -hmm. would i think it'd make a huge impact in win rates uh, unfortunately if the closer you look at bone splitters the more you realize there's just like okay if they just tweaked a couple of these yeah. knobs it would just be a lot better but uh you know it we're good and we can make it work it's uh, a lot of work for medium payoff, but it's very rewarding. Well, it's such a bummer it, too, right? They just got, they they just gave orcs two new battle tactics. Why not three? Yeah, to bring it up to bring it up to eight because yeah. everyone has eight. Well, do one do a bone splitters one where it relies on having lots of different units. So big Wa is not going to take it, right? It's like I understand like balancing and how big Wa is, is tricky in that regard, but at least for now, it's like oh uh, you complete this battle tactic if you're you know you uh, you have four bone splitters units all within 12 of each other right call it uh, yeah. pile on or or like get together mates or something dumb like that right like, get to okay. the chopper right get to the chop oh my god they, oh man it's so good that's so good get to the yeah. cho oh oh my god it's, that's such a that great... was a that was a that was an ability in Warhammer Age of Reckoning okay. for the the Orc Choppa class. Yeah, <laughs> man, what what a what a throwback blade! <laughs> My God, but it, it's perfect, right? Also, Arnold Schwarzenegger reference. So perfect, yeah. Get to the Choppa would have been great, but yeah. you know what? I'm I'm happy at least the 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 GHB ones are are pretty positive for us. It's a nice change. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm the, seeing. The... Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I was just going to say, very friendly. And, like, the last two GHBs, a lot of the reasons why you saw people just stop playing them competitively has just been, like, the tactics have been really bad. Yeah. Like, they're not friendly because we don't have the book tactics, but now we have two tactics minimum that reward high mobility, and this is possibly the most mobile army in the game. So. Big fan. So I just have a quick question for you about command points. Mm -hmm. Where, what, what commands do you value and which do you not in this army? Which one do you like more, Blade? All out attack or inspiring presence? Mm. Depends on what I'm doing at the moment, but usually I feel like inspiring presence wins more games. Because yeah. remember, a big a big part of our thing is we're actively looking for ways to deny people battle tactics, right? We're, st we're sitting there, we're trying to slog it out, build up advantage. Inspiring Presence will get there in our low bravery army. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, t you, the wall helps a lot, but still you're going to take incidental damage. And one thing that Bone Splitters hates is like, Oh god, the, the malevolent maelstrom is so annoying to play against. Because if it pops, you could potentially lose a bone yeah. split, like one guy per unit. And if that's the case, then you're rolling bravery on your entire army. And like, 
it, you're still rolling for sixes, but it's just incidentally losing models of bravery is really infuriating. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it can be a lot. Like I've like I've been there, like playing like cruel boys and stuff, right? Like that that bad bravery can be a serious weakness. So if you're playing MSU, I think like all out attack might. Well, if, if you're playing MSU and you're losing units here and there, like the difference between the two isn't as much. Um, however, if you're bulking up these big units, like a unit of 30 stickers or something like that to go and sit on a unit, they're going to get blown up. So inspiring presence is good or all out attack. If you're like throwing your unit of 10 maniacs out there to go run something over, they're both great. Um, it, it's really context. So yep. which, which don't you like? None of them. I don't. I, I. I. don't think there's a single one that doesn't matter for Moon Splitters. Like, the the army really squeezes everything it can out of out of out of, out of the rules. Uh, the more command points you get, the better. Fungoid Cave Shaman's great to get command points. The Scragrot issues commands for free. Yeah, it's just you. You really. The, the, I'm not kidding. The analog to this army right now in current books is Osiarch Bone Reapers. Like, you, you can really see the DNA of that army in Bone Splitters. So, uh, all the commands are good. Commands are great. Use them often. Yeah, even even defense. I mean, we, we kind of... We kind of talk bad about our saves because they're generally bad. But, um, you know, you've usually got one pinning unit or something similar, right? Um, that you want to have all-out defense prepared for because it's that unit's job to be there and be annoying and hold people up for a while. So they're all good. Rallying back uh, from a unit of 10 maniac or board boy maniacs is uh, pretty demoralizing for some people if you roll hot. It's, mm -hmm. They're all good. Okay, good. So let's talk about your lists. I think it's time. So you guys gave me three lists. And I am excited to go and have a look at them. So from what I can remember, you gave me... There's one from every sub-faction, I believe. No, so, there's two Icebone ones and one Drakfoot. Okay. No one's playing. Yeah. It, it, we, don't, we don't talk about Bone Grins. Uh, uh, I'll, let's just say, Okay, so you get everyone out there. Like, imagine what a sub-faction does, right? So, like, imagine, like, we've talked about Icebone, like, Mortal Wounds on Sixes to Wound in Melee, Dragfoot, it turns off wards. Bone Grins gives an extra shooting attack to one unit, which is the Arrow Boys, who hit on fives. If you if you want to shoot 800 shots in a, in a shooting phase and deal 10 damage at most to your opponent's army, right. go nuts. So it's Otherwise, giving a small buff to a bad unit. Oh my god. If you want to play with 240 wounds of bone splitters, that's the that's the list to play with. Otherwise, don't do it. So here we have an iceborne list. Ice bone list. So uh Wa inspired, right? So this is uh, whose list is this one? I can't remember. Uh, is this the one with the mega gargant? Yeah, that's the mega gargant list. That's mine. Okay, so would you like to walk us through this list? Uh and just, you know, obviously like kind of give us a a rundown of the list and what's in it and, and so on. But importantly what i'm what i'm really curious is about is like how do you actually play this list like how does the first like turn two turns sort of look how what, what's the flow of the game over the course of the whole battle and how are you bringing it all together at the end for a, for a victory like how do you win with this list sure so uh, this whole time i've been talking about boar boys you know blades alluded to it i'm a really big fan of mobility in this especially in this ghb and so i'm playing the nice bones so mortal wounds or sixes to uh, are, are uh, sixes to wound or mortal wounds equal to the damage characteristic so i've got these blocks of boar boys who are three wounds apiece now they have pretty bad saves but again going to a four up ward makes them pretty reliably tanky I have two units of 10 Savage Boar Boy Maniacs who are anywhere from 56 to 71 attacks on the charge, um, depending on how creative you get with your coherency. And then in addition, um, I've got the a block of 10 Savage Boar Boys who play the pinning strategy like I've talked about, because sometimes, this, and this is really important to how 
this version of Bone Splitters works. Sometimes you don't charge your opponent, you just get outside of three of them. Because sometimes your opponents are like, I'm going to brace, and you're like, okay, I'm not going to fight you. Here go. And the reason why you... Exactly, because like the, the the reason why you wait you wait to initiate combat is what makes bone splitters reliable is limiting the number of activations your opponents get. So the more that your opponent has the opportunity to fight, um, the more damage they do to you, which eats through your your meat, right? So if I'm at the top of one and I string out this incredibly long pinning blanket, essentially of Savage Boar Boys, um, and I don't charge you, on your turn, if you charge them, I can wah, and then that unit of 30 wounds uh, transforms into more or less a unit of 45 wounds. And they're on a 5-up save, I can give them all defense, and make them just really hard to kill. Uh, in that case, then you're fighting basically chaff. And behind that chaff is a unit of, or units of boar boy maniacs who, as we talked about, can get loaded up with buffs and they can really charge in and just do horrendous amounts of damage for their points. And then behind that, because, you know, it can't do the pregame move, is the big drog fort kicker who, with a horror frost spell, can be made to be really efficient in combat without having to use those precious command points like we talked about. So... There's just layers of meat. There's layers of abilities here. Um, this list off the top of my head is 30, 60, 90, 120, 155. This list is like 184 wounds, I think, is if I'm doing the math correctly. So a it's a lot. Wounds. It's a lot of wounds. And 90% yeah. of it moves 12 inches. Like, I really it's a like lot. this list. I, when I saw this list, I was very excited because the idea of playing like a big gargant surrounded by pigs on foot, it 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 feels good, right? I had never considered this guy. I'd, I'd always thought of Bone Splitters as being the army that likes Kragnos the most, right? Mm -hmm. But this this gargant just seems better. It seems like yeah, he's going to do more almost for fewer points. Yeah, for 250 less points, it allows you to add more bodies. And that's the Kragnos lists are still good, but the fact is, is right now, Kragnos with... Um, one of the things that isn't being talked about a lot is Kragnos versus a Merciless Blizzard. Like, he's he doesn't really have that good protection against it. And a Merciless Blizzard will not kill a Mega Gargan, but there's a non-zero chance that a merciless blizzard just straight up kills a Kragnos who's right. been partially wounded. So um, at 1980 points, you're not that far off from getting a triumph against a lot of lists out there. Your three drops because I'm taking the Antorian Acolytes. Um, brief reminder for those of you making lists out there, you can totally put a non Antorian Locust uh, unit in the Antorian Acolytes Battalion, but you have to have at least two, two Locuses alive in that battalion in order to get those get those uh, extra dice remember that because it will absolutely come up when you build your list anyway being three drops means a lot of times you're fighting for priority which is a big deal when your opponent maybe deploys badly which if there's anything in this game um, deployment will kill you more than any other choices you make mm -hmm. and people are often really bad at deploying so um, this list takes advantage of people making bad deployments and just getting in their face as soon as possible. And behind these walls of green orcs is a, merc is a mercenary mega just waiting to just absolutely demolish something that it gets hands on. And then there's a Wargog Prophet, who's the most terrifying unit in the game. Who's your general? Uh, the general is... I, I left this one kind of open... Um, most likely for me, I like really making the Maniac weird, not the general. Because he opens up reprisal pretty easily, because otherwise you're... If you're playing with boars, you're not wanting your opponent to get behind you. In which case, you're probably not charging with a Wargog Prophet. So that denies... Uh, certain things, and Weird Knob is really easy to get into your opponent's deployment to score your Grand Strat, 
just because he moves so quickly, he has the hero phase move and stuff, and he carries Shaman of the Chill Lands really well, just to run up and merciless blizzard something to death, and then get out. So, what if I wanted to take instead of a War Dock, if I wanted to take a big Stabba, uh, so mm-hmm. I can take the Great Hunter? What would you say to that? Big, big the, the, the Savage Big Boss. Um, yeah. You could. The issue is, is you couldn't take an Antorian Acolytes Battalion then, because you'd only have. Um, you have to be a non-mounted locus in order to qualify for the extra primal dice. So you would be, in that case, you would probably just switch out. Um, this would be the list where if I took the Savage Big Boss, I would take a Command Entourage for the extra artifact and then give it to my Savage Big Boss General to have the Arcane Tome and then probably change my grand strategy to... Um, to spell casting savant right like we talked about for the but trick it, it seems to me like the core of this list is a bunch of uh boar boys and the fort kicker and then after that there's a little bit of wiggle room with what you do with your the rest of your heroes so you yep. can kind of change that up a little bit but you'll have to think about your your plan as a whole when you start tweaking with with stuff like yep. this yep absolutely and i i just i love mobility a lot this is a mobile heavy, you know, the, the average speed is uh, 11 inches between yeah. the, the, the the mega, all the 12 inch boar boys. And the other thing is, is unlike your normal uh, or not normal, but your other bone splitters lists, um, the, 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 the extra three inches don't really matter to boars because they already move, they already move 12, but for guys who are on foot, like blades lists, that extra three inches matters a lot. Perfect segue. Nice. All right, Blade, let's look. So, Icebone sub-faction, right? Got your Y-inspired. Uh, yeah, do you want to walk us through the list? Is and, that, uh, is that yeah. the one you picked up, the Icebone one? Okay. Oh, sorry. Would you like to... There, I, no, no, Icebone's good. Let's keep going with Icebone. That way I don't have to explain a whole new set of uh, allegiance abilities. And yeah, by that, I mean there, there's barely a difference. On Discord, I'm just going to change my uh, stream so that I'm streaming... A, a screen instead yeah okay all right okay so i guess with when i'm designing lists and picking factions and stuff i look at what i'm trying to leverage in the meta and the list and so when i see icebone and when i've experienced icebone um the biggest advantage in the meta right now is the fact that you can ignore saves Right. Um, big saves, typically hard for this army that doesn't have any rend. So the, the tons of attacks and then wounds doing mortal wounds means that you don't need to care about saves. It also means that your buffs aren't as important because you don't need to, you don't need the rend. You don't need to land a ton. You're just going to score wounds by being there. Um, and so I went with more of a MSU kind of approach on this, because since I don't need big units to try and concentrate my buffs, I can kind of spread them out and let them come in waves and eat things up. And then if I'm playing against like massive hammers, now I'm making them split their damage um, and making that decision a little bit harder. Or I'm tying them up. If they whiff, I can run that unit off and do something somewhere else. Um, as far as, hey, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just went with Great Hunter, of course, because you want to get up and you want to claim all that space. Yes. Um, I, I really like some flexibility here. I, I have the, the Boar Boys for Battle Line. And what you can do is you can look at your opponent's list and you figure out what you want to be your primary screen. So if your opponent doesn't have a lot of rend or the things they're going to be charging into you aren't that bad, um, you know, basically, if they're charging you with monsters that are going to blow up what they run into no matter what, throw some big stabbers up there and they'll do some mortal wounds on the way out. If you need your big stabbers to survive a little bit and maybe put in some damage, screen with your boar boys and then have the big stabbers come in after and clean up. Um, there's some flexibility in how you can kind of set yourself up. Uh, because I'm so many drops, I'm assuming I'm going to take the first turn, and I'm assuming that I'm going to get doubled. 
Right. You're, so, so you're going to play in. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm, I'm baking that into my plan. I'm layering things up. Um, and I'm trying to guide where I want my opponent to charge. Uh, something you'll see with both my lists, I run two Wurgog Prophets. Um, as yeah. I think it's it's the main hammer in the force, For sure. and it's also your main control piece. If your opponent doesn't know what, or if your opponent doesn't appreciate the advice that you gave them about not walking up to the Wurgog Prophet, then you can certainly take advantage of that and put your Wurgog Prophet next to something that they certainly want to charge. If they do know about the Wurgog Prophet, now I'm going to start marching him around the board to push my enemies away from him. Um, into space that I want. Uh, sending things out in waves, so your your boar boys can do some damage on the way in, just because you have volumes of attacks and uh, and you're doing mortal wounds. Um, I don't know. There's a bunch of little treats in here, so I've got a lot of. I took the spell lore enhancement. Yes. Um, to again stack up on that redundancy that we talked about before. So my my Wargog prophet with the glowing tattoos has Gorkamorka's war cry and power of the werebor because first turn I'm probably not going to be lasering anything um, unless my opponent messed up their deployment. Uh, so power of the werebor is just a great buff to throw out, and then you can cast his war scroll spell or his uh, or mystic shield or something like that as his second spell. Um, Gorkamorka Warcry specifically, because like I said earlier, if he's down to like one or two wounds, I'd rather try and heal him up in the next hero phase and then laser later. So the the Warcry is something for him to do to be useful uh, when I'm being engaged or if I need to set up a powerful combat to turn the tide of the fight. Uh, the other one has uh, Horfrost and Merciless Blizzard. Uh, I like Why to... Not? While you, I know. Well, so we we joked earlier with uh, why would you take it on him? Um, and that's because I like to have the one that can actually cast. Um, right, the one that's not going to be staring. Right, right, right. Um, so being able to cast Horfrost so I have a buff and still be able to nuke something nearby. Um, not to mention, since he's a double caster, he's very likely to get the plus one to cast buff from the Wardock if I'm not using it to heal or something like that. Uh, so I, I like the flexibility of having him to be able to use both of his spells. And the amount of damage you're likely to take on a blizzard is much lower than a Wurgog Stare too. Yeah, uh, I think here's... that's great. <laughs> it's so, that just puts it into perspective. It's like everyone's freaking out about this great spell. And you're like, oh yeah, but we've been doing that for the whole book. <laughs> uh, it, it, yes, since, since the edition, right? Yeah. Um, and blizzard, you're going to take, what, I think average two wounds? when you cast or something like that, not even, you'll take one or two wounds. And so he's got seven wounds. He'll be able to survive that and still throw out a buff or something like that, which is what great. Guy. Yeah, there, it's just such a good war scroll. Um, Maniac Weird Knob, of course, for the, you do want glowy green tusks because you do have those units of boar boys and sticking it on that, um, that unit of 10 boar boys so that if you're gonna charge them in to pin down you can actually get that just that little bit of damage out of them um or if they're stuck in combat and they're not getting their bonuses to charge um boar boys the boars always get plus one to hit plus one to wound when you charge and if you take spears the spears also get plus one to hit plus one to wound if they charge otherwise you're on fours and fours so getting that extra two rend even though yes you're hoping that you put through mortal wounds you don't always put through moral wounds so those little incremental advantages and then yeah the gimmick of fast and merciless blizzard um if you're not going to use him to go and claim some objective out from under your opponent big fan uh yeah so as, as far as what you're doing again you're, you're controlling space you're looking to grab either the um the one where you're out of your deployment zone or casting spells by leaving someone back early on and trying to crowd up objectives and make your opponent either split up or charge into your Wurgogs and then grind. Uh, double turn can be hard with some armies. I think that's just kind of a, a bone splitters thing. Um, so if you get charged by 
uh, like what is it the, the like four tyrants list and yeah. or uh, knights of the empty throne um low medium to low rend high damage armies i think are uniquely positioned against bone splitters because usually we leverage our wounds but they can get through all of our saves and just punch hard right so you know you're more than a lot of factions you really have to know what you're up against and what they're trying to do and you're trying to space them out and um in this case you're trying to take down heroes or units that would normally be like way tanky this list looks like it is going to be more difficult to play i think yes yeah I, this looks like a I, higher I, skill cap list I, I think it depends on how you think because i've tried lists with like lots of pigs and charging and those are more difficult for me to play like i've tried the kragnos lists and it's just the way the engagements work doesn't align with me as well like they may be more powerful but this aligns with more of how i think and how i like to kind of orchestrate and drive the game uh it definitely does take more brain power uh and yeah after five rounds it can be <laughs> it can be a lot and you start to make some mistakes but again that's you training up to be a better player right you're learning how to stay in it how to keep thinking how to look multiple turns ahead get good uh 187 wounds in this list by the yeah, way so many wounds <laughs> so many wounds Absolutely. How about it's in MSU, your, um, right? It is MSU. How about in your in your other list? My Drakfoot list. Yeah. So uh, we alluded to it earlier. Drakfoot, their whole faction ability is that, well, more boys become battle line, which is kind of nice. But um, you ignore ward saves with your melee attacks. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't affect, like, the Wargog or your spells. But uh, if you're able to put out, like, vast volumes of attacks, like this army is, you can really prey on those armies that rely on their ward saves so contrary to what calvin said earlier he, he, he and i talked about this uh, fire slayers i think is actually a time when this is great like all of their bubbles mean nothing um and you want them to charge you anyways so you're you're removing a significant portion of their faction abilities uh nurgle can be a good matchup for this because you ignore like their five up ward doesn't mean much it's just if they're on like something that's three up saves like blight kings it, it can be pretty tough um there so armies that yeah rely on their ward saves in general this can be good the problem is we're giving up those mortal wounds to do that and so to compensate we need to incorporate some ways to punch through those armor saves so i've leaned a bit more into the buffs which relying on magic is a little tough anyways so um uh leaning or grouping up our units so they can benefit more from those buffs so that we can deliver them and they can chew through those units that would normally be more tanky um other than that the gameplay is kind of the same right we're moving up we're we're globbing up the board we just are choosing our fights um a little differently i do, i went with the wergog prophet as the general with the master of magic again because i am extra interested in getting those buffs off he's got hoarfrost because i want to put that on my block of 10 more boys right um he's got the or or on some maniacs if they're gonna run off and do something or go in for a wave two fight yeah and those um, big stab is with getting through wards are gonna slap pretty hard yeah, they surprising. They really surprise people. Um, I I have a one of my core, someone I play with a lot plays uh, BCR or um, Ma Tribes quite a bit, and man, those things take down Stonehorns if the opponent's not yeah. careful. <laughs> this looks like the kind of tech where if your local meta, if there's like somebody in your local meta that you want to really get at, this will do that for sure. And and I I, I that's a great point and something i wanted to really emphasize is like drakfoot is really cool in a vacuum i think icebone is the more powerful pick but there are ghbs metas um both local and and grand that rely on ward saves right we, we kind of go in these cycles where armor saves get better and then they get a little worse but ward saves get better and they trade off and if you can 
if you're going into an area or a meta that has a lot of ward saves, man, this can this can be really, really good. For sure. Well, and but really, really good for bone splitters, for right? For bone splitters, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's uh, keep it in context here. Yeah. Um, so I mean, a unit of twenty more boys. So that's what that reinforced unit is. They're on thirty twos with one inch reach. So you're very unlikely going to be able to get all 20 of them in combat. But even then, they can charge something, do some damage, and you've got a 40 wound unit. Um, that on combination of WA, you can really tie some stuff up and, and swing some battle tactics. Um, this is the kind of army where you want to stack uh, your Horfrost, Glowy Green Tusks, and um, did I put... Power of the Werebore? Yeah, okay. Power of yep. the Werebore as well, right? You can really soup up a unit to go take something and then have them, like, hang out. Either they, they claim an objective and now they're bait to pull them off to that, uh, or they just are able to take down a prime target kind of in the mid-game that's been left open. Uh, I've got two War Docks, each with Warcry and Merciless Blizzard. Usually they're going to be dancing rather than casting. You have to choose, which kind of sucks. Um... Maybe we'll get that Swamp Call a change, right? Where we can do both. <laughs> cannot no. cannot be a dancer and a wizard. It's um, too bad. But yeah, if there's no one in range to buff with the cast or to heal, um, then you know you want some out. Merciless Blizzard is great because they're you, you said it earlier. They're 80 points. They're throwaway. You can run them around either to take an objective and and or just go try and like suicide someone yeah. to pull you out of a bad spot well it's like i'm gonna uh, throw a blizzard at you every turn careful <laughs> right um you can blizzard with your wergog and laser with your other wergog and still have gorkamorka's war cry to try and tie some stuff down on like your third engagement right this is one of those armies where you're at some point probably going to be engaged with a significant portion of it yeah. and so being able to manipulate that combat in any way that you can is good um two word, two word ox is also great because um that heal is really nice and i don't think we quite touched on this and people might not understand but the wergog prophet ability happens at the start of the hero phase yep is, so after it also at the start of the hero phase is when dancing and heroic recovery happens so you can do both of those either before and or after doing your stare so you can heal up, stare, and then heal up again if you've got your bubbles yeah, or, all set or up. Or you to do can, that. if you have like an injured Wergog, you can try to do two. Well, no, um, is the is the dance at the beginning of the hero phase as well? I thought it was. Let me double check. Um, but still, you could like heroic recovery your Wergog before you stare. Right, like if it's if it's already taken some damage, you can try to heal, and then with that information make a choice that's something yep. that uh is actually it's uh, something i've been thinking about a lot this past week or two is how you can do things at the beginning of your hero phase before you pick your battle tactic yeah mm -hmm. and and in fact knowing when and to, when to choose what to shape how your opponent plays like the information yeah. they have yeah so when you do heroic action they have to take their heroic action immediately after and so you do that, and then you reveal which battle tactic or something, which may have changed how they're doing their heroic action. Um, so just to step in here real quick. Yeah. For one, the war doc is definitely at the start of the hero phase because it's instead it of casting or dispels. Right. Uh, secondly, to your point, Blade, and I do want to clarify there, people are so used to being like, okay, what's your heroic action? And it's like, oh, I do heroic recovery. And then, okay, my heroic action is to get a command point. No. So here's the thing. Mm-hmm. You do all of your at the start of the hero phase stuff before they do. That's and that's important because when you go to get your command points, you get your command points at the start of your hero phase if it's your turn. And then after you've done all of your stuff, your opponent gets their command point for the turn if their general is alive at the start of the at, during their portion of the at the start of the hero phase. That also includes heroic actions. So you could do the war dog stare, the war dog dance, your heroic actions, getting your command point and picking your battle tactic before they've gotten to do anything. So you could potentially shoot their general off with your laser and they don't oh. get their command point. And it's 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 a super small thing, 
but it, it, it that could be it yeah. matters a lot yeah and it also matters because they they would then have to go and pick who else are they going to do like the heroic action with so, so yeah. i just want to clarify there because there's to your point a lot of good stuff at the start of your face with the work on it, yeah it's something that in this game is not very clearly lined out so like to draw an, another magic the gathering comparison right it's like untap phase uh upkeep phase draw phase right it's like the game is really broken into small little phases that occur over the course of the game and uh this game is not and i feel like it needs to be in the hero phase needs four sub phases they're trying. It's, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, that's a good, thanks, Calvin, for clearing that up. Um, that is good. So yeah, you, knowing it's the order of operations of stuff, for doing yeah. things in your uh, in your hero phase is pretty important yep. for what you have access to. I, yep. uh, I have a cheeky unit of Stabas in this list for exactly the reasons we talked about earlier. Um, sometimes I want that minus one to hit. It's really valuable in some matchups. Um, Chaos Knights, man, it does work on them. Uh, so it's it, having a guy that can run around, grab objectives, be in the way, have that minus one to hit, and be probably a better save than the rest and of your they're army. They're quite good at stealing objectives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I had the space, so I thought I'd try out Ether Void Pendulum just as a way. Remember, we're trying to get through. Uh, we, we don't have as many ways to ignore armor saves as we do in Icebone, right? So any kind of incidental, like, mortal wounds that we can pick up. Um, I still don't know that I rate Endless Spells super highly in this GHB, especially for Bone Splitters, but there are times when you're just lined up, like, it, you can sneak your Maniac Weird Knob around, uh, back and around the side, and all your opponents are in one long engagement line. You can send a, a Pendulum through there or something like that, or snipe a hero off on the corner. Uh... I, I, I had the 40 points, and I, I think the potential for the damage uh, with this sub-faction is useful. Any other uh, comments or questions about these lists? There's one sort of final thing I wanted to ask you guys about. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Calvin, what do you think? Uh, hey, man. You know, sometimes you just slap a bunch of meat on the table, and your opponent just bounces off of it. It's great. I, I I will say the more drops you have, the more brain power you activate. Uh, the more units you have, the more you're moving models. Uh, I played a 204 wound list at LVO with old Gloomspite gets allies, and I will never do that again. <laughs> I do not. Re I don't recommend doing that if you if you intend on drinking because your brain can only handle touching. Uh, stab us so many times but that being said uh, these armies are a lot of fun there's a lot of it, surprisingly there's a lot of vari variance between uh, uh, what Blade likes to play and what I like to play in an army that has like what 10 war scrolls so yeah, it, I think it's literally 10 might be 11 we're not counting the underworld war band yeah I think it sucks no, it's great. It's uh, it's three awesome hero proxies in one box. Yeah, it's great. I mean, if you need another war gog, you don't want to deal with resin. There you go. But um, what you got for us, Moss? So, what does the future bone splitters look like with this oh, new God. with this new GHB with the FAQs that came out with the points changes with the new battle tactics and even with like war bands, right? Like, it feels like bone splitters are being ignored completely by GW. <laughs> And people are talking, right? It's like, are bone yeah. splitters going to be removed from the game? Uh, I've heard some cool ideas that the next orc book is going to be like bone splitter, or sorry, iron jaws and cruel boys as like Gork and Mork, right? And there'll be one book that has two halves, right? Like, uh, are bone splitters going back to old hammer, right? Like what? Like what do you think? And 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 if you're a player who's thinking about getting into bone splitters, or you are into bone splitters, if 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 you could say something to those players, like what are, what are your guys' thoughts on the, on this? I okay, I I, I I'm susceptible to doom hammer sometimes. <laughs> you know, just being a big doomer, I of course am on social media, and that's not healthy at all when you're trying to have like rational discourse about you know how you feel about your hobby. I I guys, I love this army. Like I do, I know for a fact. Blade, if you guys ever get to see 
the level of effort Blade has put into his army, it is mind-bending how cool it is. And the people that really play this army and enjoy it, they love it because it's such a unique aesthetic. It's such a unique way to play the game. In this GHB, this is the best GHB we've had for them since the Bounty Hunters GHB, surprisingly. Um, I think it has a lot of play. I've been, <laughs> no lie, I stopped playing after LVO because this past GHB was not very kind. I've been meta chasing and I'm, you know, in preparation for this video, I'm, I've been really, really valuing how the army does. So I'm looking forward to getting more games into it. Now, when it comes to like a long term, I mean, look what happened to the Space Marines, right? If, if you've paid attention at all, there's a whole list of things that have been in the range forever for Space Marines and Warhammer 40,000 that just got sent to Legends. Never going to get printed again. Could Bone Splitters go that way? You have to think, does GW for Age of Sigmar determine the sales for an army based on its competitiveness? And the answer, I think, is no. And it's particularly true for Bone Splitters because... This is a very easy army to collect. There's to get three quarters of the war scrolls. It's one of two boxes, either the Savage right. War Boys box or the Savage uh, Oryx box. That's ha that's oh, three quarters of the war scrolls. Otherwise, you're just buying heroes that are dirt cheap comparatively. This is a very cheap army to collect. So this is a really great entry point into into Age of Sigmar for people who just want something simple, easy to paint. I am a Neanderthal when it comes to the hobby part of this biz of the uh, you know of this game. Uh, I know how to dry brush things and thank God for slap chop because in contrast paints cuz I'm terrible at it. But I can still get a, this I by the way, on an aside, you're going to paint so many butts if you play this army. <laughs> so many butts. I I I think I've painted like it, 200 individual cheeks at this point it, it's 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 cathartic at a certain point make sure to highlight those anyway the um it, it, to me i think there's still going to be bone splitters around it, it's a dirt cheap collector's army it's really simple to get into um, there's a lot of depth when you really think about it um that other armies just don't have i think it's competitive again excited to explore those avenues but if you're looking for something that has, you know, a, a, a collector's dream army like Soul Light or something, I wouldn't play it if that's what you're in for. Because for the most part, it, it, you're looking at the same models over and over again. They're really cool models. They're naked dudes riding pigs. That's sweet. They have bones for weapons and they don't care. They're, they're really cool. It's... I, I, I could go on forever. Blade, just, please make me stop talking. I, I'm, you go nuts. Stop talking, Kevin. Okay. Um, I I hear a lot of, like, doom and gloom, because I think doom hammer, right? People like there to be some kind of dread or drama. Um, I don't think any of the arguments really hold up to scrutiny, but they're, they're not, like, far too far-fetched i guess i think people want to point to the rogue idol being retired but people were talking about the rogue idol being retired for like a year or two before it happened uh and that's be that's more of a forge world thing right because forge world is changing so could something change absolutely um but we haven't seen a range retired yet that had its own battle tome like bone splitters had its own battle tome at launch then they brought them together in second edition for the orc war clans book um They've been a big part of the lore all that time. So I, I don't see them going away. Like we've gotten we, part of the reason we don't get new kits is because we share a book with two new yeah. two like headliner factions, right? Iron Jaws are one of the, if not the best model range in Age of Sigmar. They exude everything that Age of Sigmar is about. Cruel Boys are new. They're sweet. They're what GW is super proud of. Um, and you can't feed three sides of a book at the same time so I don't, I don't know i can see why 
bone splitters i mean the, the kits are old they're not people aren't buying them as much they're they're not super duper old except I feel for the, like like the heroes i feel like if the if they're gonna stick around and they're gonna be part of the like you know fourth edition let's say they need mm -hmm. a refresh they need what's what they just got for seraphon right they need like some 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 new sculpts for some, some old models right and they need some something some new and interesting stuff right like you can't just leave the it as it is forever right, right? it needs to be updated and have a refresh because like the saurus warriors and all that like they did such a great job i feel like they could do the same thing for bone splitters and absolutely like, and like you said mm -hmm. not a huge model range right it's not like you have to make a new everything you just gotta like five different models and suddenly you know blammo refreshed yeah and the other thing is, is and, and this is me going you know uh, super high on the hopium here but <laughs> it, uh you know flesh eater courts just got a really big update in the harbinger's book Right, they they, they they got significantly better. If you haven't played Flesh Eater Chords yet with these new updates, y'all, dear God, it is, it, it, it's, oh boy, is it an experience. So uh, what I'm predicting, and this is just me coming off, you know, off the top of my head here, you know, we didn't get any updates in the Battle Scroll. Could we see something in the Harbinger's books? Could there be a refresh? Because they fixed a sub faction and updated war scrolls for flesh eater courts, even though they are the last second edition book. And then you have orc war clans where two of the war clans got tactics, but the bone splitters didn't. Yeah. To me, I'm hoping, hoping that this means that we're going to get something in the heart of this book. I know iron jaws is getting the, the, the vaunted big pig. Yep. Whatever it's actually called, but, Who uh, cares? It's, it's just the big pig. big pig. I think it's called the Ma Grunta. It is. The, you know, they could call it whatever. It's the big pig. Yeah, well, but, uh, it's, just, it's, how many should I buy? That's the only question I have. I know, right? So hopefully that means that the big pig is the new release. They get gets the cool rules, but maybe Bone Splitters gets a bone thrown in. Pun huh. definitely intended. I could see a new hero. So in, in like the second edition when they did all the launch boxes, everyone got like a hero with their new battle tome. I could definitely see something like that. Um, and then maybe a refresh of some of the other heroes through Underworlds or Warcry or something like that. I feel mm -hmm. like it, it, there are enough settings in AOS that one of them, Bone Splitters, are just a, a straight plot into. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's potential. I don't see them going away. That being said, I don't see them getting a ton of attention in the near future. I, I think it's one of those things where they're going to sit on it at some point. They're going to, like, overhaul the faction. Maybe, like, Cities yeah. of Sigmar. And then the, the current kits... It's Cities of Sigmar, they're retiring some stuff, but they all have one-to-one -one replacements in the book, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, maybe something like that. The fine cast heroes show their age. The uh, Get get better at converting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, Blade, I have a question. Yeah. And I, I want you to just be honest with me. If they did a refresh and they gave us a new war doc model, do you want a new war doc with or without the rings? With or without the, the what? The nipple rings? The nipple rings, yes. Uh, mm, I feel like if they keep the nipple rings, it needs to be AOSified. Like, <laughs> what would like that the, even look like? Like the nipple rings need like patches and bandoliers and like <laughs> insignias on them. And, and he'll need and he'll need a match like it'll and it'll have like the Y chain that goes to the associated belly button ring from which <laughs> from which hangs like a skull. Like oh, it needs God. to be totally over designed this and super ostentatious nipple rings. I, I have four war docs and I would certainly buy more if they <laughs> if they made them like that. If, uh, if, if, no joke. If you haven't seen them yet, go go Google what a war doc looks like. They have nipple rings. Why? I don't know. Um, from a hobby aspect, I guess something we overlooked, this army has a huge potential for conversions. Like, the kits are so interchangeable, and the sculpts are so wacky that there's just so much you can do with it. So if you like doing that, um, it can be cheaper. I mean, you get lots of extra boys that you can convert into heroes, and lots of, like, interesting things you can do with the army. 
without i mean it's orcs so if it looks kind of like crummy well i mean it's orcs so it looks kind of crummy anyways um, how, how dare you <laughs> <laughs> the it, absolutely though i've had part of the reason i've stuck with this army for so long is because i've had so much fun converting them i'm definitely going to rebase my pig shaped rogue idol into a big pig once they uh release that base size um i it's... think it'll be on a standard monster size right um, the 120, I think so too. Yeah, it'll be it'll be tough to squeeze my enormous rock pit, my Gorka Morka Porka on there, but we'll get there. Um, All right. So that's I guess that's one thing is like enjoy the parts of the hobby that you like, and I've, there's a lot of non gameplay stuff to enjoy, but they're also fun and unique on the tabletop, and it's those things together that make Bone Splitters really enjoyable. Yeah, you I know? wish they could see more play in uh, just in Big Wa. Mm, yeah, I, I wish they were less, uh, not, what's what's the word um, for when a, a, a mechanic needs more of itself to be better? Uh, anyways, um, I, I wish they were not so synergistic and were a bit more autonomous. That way they could play they with the other factions better. They just needed their other rule. Mm -hmm. like, it, like, yeah, there's a lot of, like, if they had any other other rules, they would do better. Anyway, or, I or, think uh, yeah. we should probably... Any any closing thoughts? I think we should probably. Uh, I think we're about ready to wrap it up. What do you guys think? Yeah. Um, I we we just spent several hours talking about an army that has ten war scrolls. It, it's <laughs> it, I, I guys I I literally cannot tell you just how much fun it is to play this army. It's so weird. It does such unique things that a lot of other armies have copied. Like the DNA of Bone Splitters is everywhere. Like just just the concepts of how it plays and stuff. It, it it there's a very very passionate following. You know, Blade and I are like t like twenty percent of it in in and of ourselves. But the fact is, is like this, you can do well with it. You will absolutely surprise people who are used to playing armies that just steamroll others, and then you're like, here's here's all here's my naked dudes. Oh look, you can't win the game now. It's it's so much fun, and it's a really great way. If you know someone who's, you know, kind of cowed by the the, the, the breadth of the rules of Age of Sigmar, Bone Splitters is a really good way to get into it. I really love the aesthetic. If you like the concept of the of the of the feralness of you know just these these guys who like writing in the comment going into fighting it is a great army to pick up to play to learn how to play to get really good at the game to hobby with it um i hate painting and i love painting these guys because it's so cathartic painting butt cheeks is so great 10 out of 10 would recommend uh gorka morka rules that's 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 all i've got <laughs> all right guys well thanks for so much for the time I, uh, I'm really yeah. glad you guys uh, decided to come by and have a little and uh, educate me in the in the realm of bone splitters. I appreciate it. I'm still looking for an Iron Jaws champion out there who would like to share their knowledge with the rest of us. So if you know somebody, let me know. Like, subscribe, wah.